Chapter 19 The Howitzer The Yuma's Attack A Skirmish Glanton Appropriates the Ferry The Hanged Judas The Coffers A Deputation for the Coast San Diego Arranging for Supplies Brown at the Farriers A Dispute Webster and Toadvine Freed The Ocean An Altercation a man burned alive. Brown endurance vile. Tales of treasure. An escape. A murder in the mountains. Glanton leaves Yuma. They all called the hanged. Hostages. Returns to Yuma. Doctor and judge, nigger and fool. Dawn on the river. Carts without wheels. Murder of Jackson. The Yuma Massacre. The doctor had been bound for California when the ferry fell into his hands, for the most by chance. In the ensuing months he'd amassed a considerable wealth in gold and silver and jewelry. He and the two men who worked for him had taken up residence on the west bank of the river, overlooking the ferry landing, among the abutments of an unfinished hillside fortification made from mud and rock. In addition to the pair of freight wagons he'd inherited from Major Graham's command, he had also a mountain howitzer, a bronze twelve-pounder with a bore the size of a saucer, and this piece stood idle and unloaded in its wooden truck. In the doctor's crude quarters, he and Glanton and the judge, together with Brown and Irving, sat drinking tea, and Glanton sketched for the doctor a few of their Indian adventures, and advised him strongly to secure his position. The doctor demurred. He claimed to get along well with the Yumas. Glanton told him to his face that any man who trusted an Indian was a fool. The doctor colored, but he held his tongue. The judge intervened. He asked the doctor did he consider the pilgrims huddled on the far shore to be under his protection. The doctor said that he did so consider them. The judge spoke reasonably and with concern, and when Glanton and his detail returned down the hill to cross to their camp, they had the doctor's permission to fortify the hill and charge the howitzer, and to this end they set about running the last of their lead until they had close on to a hatful of rifle balls. They loaded the howitzer that evening with something like a pound of powder and the entire cast of shot and they trundled the piece to a place of advantage overlooking the river and the landing below. Two days later, the Yumas attacked the crossing. The scows were on the west bank of the river, discharging cargo as arranged, and the travelers stood by to claim their goods. The savages came, both mounted and afoot, out of the willows with no warning, and swarmed across the open ground toward the ferry. On the hill above them, Brown and Long Webster swung the howitzer and steadied it, and Brown crammed his lighted cigar into the touch hole. Even over that open terrain, the concussion was immense. The howitzer in its truck leaped from the ground and clattered smoking backward across the packed clay. On the floodplain below the fort, a terrible destruction had passed, and upward of a dozen of the Yumas lay dead or writhing in the sand. A great howl went up among them, and Glanton and his riders defiled out of the wood littoral upriver, and rode upon them, and they cried out in rage at their betrayal. Their horses began to mill, and they pulled them about, and loosed arrows at the approaching dragoons, and were shot down in volleys of pistol fire, and the debarkees at the crossing scrabbled up their arms from among the dunnage, and knelt and set up a fire from that quarter while the women and children lay prone among the trunks and freight boxes. The horses of the Yumas reared and screamed and churned about in the loose sand with their hoop-shaped nostrils and whited eyes, and the survivors made for the willows from which they'd emerged, leaving on the field the wounded and the dying and the dead. Glanton and his men did not pursue them. They dismounted and walked methodically among the fallen, dispatching them, man and horse alike, each with a pistol ball through the brain, while the ferry travelers watched, and then they took the scalps. The doctor stood on the low parapet of the works in silence, 
and watched the bodies dragged down the landing and booted and shoved into the river. He turned and looked at Brown and Webster. They'd hauled the howitzer back to its position, and Brown sat easily on the warm barrel, smoking his cigar and watching the activity below. The doctor turned and walked back to his quarters. Nor did he appear the following day. Glanton took charge of the operation of the ferry. People who had been waiting three days to cross at a dollar a head were now told that the fare was four dollars. And even this tariff was in effect for no more than a few days. Soon they were operating a sort of Procrustean ferry where the fares were tailored to accommodate the purses of the travelers. Ultimately, all pretense was dropped and the immigrants were robbed outright. Travelers were beaten and their arms and goods appropriated, and they were sent destitute and beggared into the desert. The doctor came down to remonstrate with them and was paid his share of the revenues and sent back. Horses were taken, and women violated, and bodies began to drift past the Yuma camp downriver. As these outrages multiplied, the doctor barricaded himself in his quarters and was seen no more. In the following month, a company from Kentucky under General Patterson arrived, and disdaining to bargain with Glanton, constructed a ferry downriver, and crossed and moved on. This ferry was taken over by the Yumas, and operated for them by a man named Callahan. But within days it was burned, and Callahan's headless body floated anonymously downriver, a vulture standing between the shoulder blades in clerical black, silent rider to the sea. Easter in that year fell on the last day of March. And at dawn on that day, the kid, together with Toadvine and a boy named Billy Carr, crossed the river to cut willow poles at a place where they grew upstream from the encampment of immigrants. Passing through this place before it was yet good light, they encountered a party of Sonorans up and about, and they saw hanging from a scaffold a poor Judas, fashioned from straw and old rags, who wore on his canvas face a painted scowl that reflected in the hand that had executed it no more than a child's conception of the man and his crime. The Sonorans had been up since midnight drinking, and they had lit a bonfire on the bench of loam where the gibbet stood, and as the Americans passed along the edge of their camp, they called out to them in Spanish. Someone had brought a long cane from the fire tipped with lighted tow, and the Judas was being set afire. Its raggedy clothes were packed with squibs and rockets, and as the fire took hold, it began to blow apart piece by piece in a shower of burning rags and straw, until at last a bomb and its breeches went off, and blew the thing to pieces in a stink of soot and sulfur, and the men cheered, and small boys threw a few last stones at the blackened remnants dangling from the noose. The kid was the last to pass through the clearing and the Sonorans called out to him and offered him wine from a goatskin. But he shrugged up his rag of a coat about his shoulders and hurried on. By now, Glanton had enslaved a number of Sonorans, and he kept crews of them working at the fortification of the hill. There were also detained in their camp a dozen or more Indian and Mexican girls, some little more than children. Glanton supervised with some interest the raising of the walls about him, but otherwise left his men to pursue the business at the crossing with a terrible latitude. He seemed to take little account of the wealth they were amassing, although daily he'd open the brass lock with which the wood and leather trunk in his quarters was secured and raise the lid and empty whole sacks of valuables into it, the trunk already holding thousands of dollars in gold and silver coins, as well as jewelry, watches, pistols, raw gold and little leather stives, silver in bars, knives, silverware, plate, teeth. On the 2nd of April, David Brown, with Long Webster and Toadvine, set out for the town of San Diego on the old Mexican coast for the purpose of obtaining supplies. They took with them a string of pack animals, and they left at sunset, riding up out of the trees and looking back at the river, and then walking the horses sideways down the dunes into the cool blue dusk. They crossed the desert in five days without incident, 
and rode up through the coastal range and led the mules through the snow in the gap and descended the western slope and entered the town in a slow drizzle of rain. Their hide clothing was heavy with water, and the animals were stained with the silt that had leached out of them and their trappings. Mounted U.S. cavalry passed them in the mud of the street, and in the distance beyond they could hear the sea boom shuddering on the gray and stony coast. Brown took from the horn of his saddle a fiber morale filled with coins, and the three of them dismounted and entered a whiskey grocer's, and unannounced they upended the sack on the grocer's board. There were doubloons minted in Spain and in Guadalajara, and half doubloons, and gold dollars, and tiny gold half dollars, and French coins of ten franc value, and gold eagles, and half eagles, and ring dollars, and dollars minted in North Carolina and Georgia that were twenty-two carats pure. The grocer weighed them out by stacks in a common scale, sorted by their mintings, and he drew corks and poured measures round in small tin cups whereon the gills were stamped. They drank and set down the cups again, and he pushed the bottle across the raw sash-milled boards of the counter. They had drafted a list of supplies to be contracted for, and when they'd agreed on the price of flour and coffee and a few other staples, they turned into the street, each with a bottle in his fist. They went down the plank-board walkway and crossed through the mud, and they went past rows of raw-looking shacks and crossed a small plaza beyond which they could see the low sea rolling, and a small encampment of tents, and a street where the squatting houses were made of hides ranged like curious dories along the selvage of sea oats above the beach, and quite black and shining in the rain. It was in one of these that Brown woke the next morning. He had little recollection of the prior night, and there was no one in the hut with him. The remainder of their money was in a bag around his neck. He pushed open the framed hide door and stepped out into the darkness and the mist. They'd neither put up nor fed their animals, and he made his way back to the grocer's where they retired and sat on the walkway and watched the dawn come down from the hills behind the town. Noon he was red-eyed and reeking before the alcalde's door, demanding the release of his companions. The alcalde vacated out the back of the premises, and shortly there arrived an American corporal and two soldiers who warned him away. An hour later he was at the farriery. Standing warily in the doorway, peering into the gloom until he could make out the shape of things within. The farrier was at his bench, and Brown entered and laid before him a polished mahogany case with a brass nameplate bratted to the lid. He unsnapped the catches and opened the case, and raised from their recess within a pair of shotgun barrels, and he took up the stock with the other hand. He hooked the barrels into the patent breech, and stood the shotgun on the bench, and pushed the fitted pin home to secure the forearm. He cocked the hammers with his thumbs and let them fall again. The shotgun was English-made, and had Damascus barrels and engraved locks, and the stock was burl mahogany. He looked up. The farrier was watching him. "'You work on guns?' said Brown. "'I do, some. I need these barrels cut down.' The man took the gun and held it in his hands. There was a raised center rib between the barrels, and inlaid in gold the maker's name, London. There were two platinum bands in the patent breech, and the locks and hammers were chased with scrollwork cut deeply in the steel, and there were partridges engraved at either end of the maker's name there. The purple barrels were welded up from triple scalps, and the hammered iron and steel bore a watered figure like the markings of some alien and antique serpent, rare and beautiful and lethal. And the wood was figured with a deep red feather grain at the butt, and held a small spring-loaded silver cap box in the toe. The farrier turned the gun in his hands and looked at Brown. He looked down at the case. It was lined with green baize, and there were little fitted compartments that held a wad cutter, a pewter powder flask, cleaning jags, a patent pewter capper. "'You need what?' he said. 
Cut the barrels down. Long about in here. He held a finger across the piece. I can't do that. Brown looked at him. You can't do it. No, sir. He looked around the shop. Well, he said, I'd have thought any damn fool could saw the barrels off a shotgun. There's something wrong with you. Why would anybody want to cut the barrels off a gun like this? What did you say? said Brown. The man tendered the gun nervously. I just meant that I don't see why anybody would want to ruin a good gun like this here. What would you take for it? It ain't for sale. You think there's something wrong with me? No, I don't. I didn't mean it that way. Are you going to cut them barrels down or ain't you? I can't do that. Can't or won't? You pick the one that best suits you. Brown took the shotgun and laid it on the bench. What would you have to have to do it? He said. I ain't doing it. If a man wanted it done, what would be a fair price? I don't know. A dollar? Brown reached into his pocket and came up with a handful of coins. He laid a two and a half dollar gold piece on the bench. Now, he said, I'm paying you two and a half dollars. The farrier looked at the coin nervously. I don't need your money, he said. You can't pay me to butcher that there gun. You done been paid. No, I ain't. Yonder it lays. Now you can either get to Sarn or you can default. In the case of which I aim to take it out of your ass. The farrier didn't take his eyes off Brown. He began to back away from the bench, and then he turned and ran. When the sergeant of the guard arrived, Brown had the shotgun chucked up in the bench vice and was working at the barrels with a hacksaw. The sergeant walked around to where he could see his face. What do you want? said Brown. This man says you threatened his life. What man? This man. The sergeant nodded toward the door of the shed. Brown continued to saw. You call that a man? he said. I never give him no leave to come in here and use my tools, neither, said the farrier. Well, how about it, said the sergeant. How about what? How do you answer to this man's charges? He's a liar. You never threatened him? That's right. The hell he never... I don't threaten people. I told him I'd whip his ass, and that's as good as notarized. You don't call that a threat? Brown looked up. It was not no threat. It was a promise. He bent to the work again, and another few passes with the saw and the barrels dropped to the dirt. He laid down the saw and backed off the jaws of the vice and lifted out the shotgun and unpinned the barrels from the stock and fitted the pieces into the case and shut the lid and latched it. What was the argument about? said the sergeant. There wasn't no argument that I know of. You better ask him where he got that gun he's just ruined. He stole that somewhere, as you can wager on it. Where'd you get the shotgun? said the sergeant. Brown bent down and picked up the severed barrels. They were about eighteen inches long, and he had them by the small end. He came around the bench and walked past the sergeant. He put the gun case under his arm. At the door he turned. The farrier was nowhere in sight. He looked at the sergeant. I believe that man has done withdrawed his charges, he said. Like as not, he was drunk. As he was crossing the plaza toward the little mud cabildo, he encountered Toadvine and Webster, newly released. They were wild-looking, and they stank. The three of them went down to the beach and sat looking out at the long gray swells and passing Brown's bottle among them. They'd none of them seen an ocean before. Brown walked down and held his hand to the sheet of spume that ran up the dark sand. He lifted his hand and tasted the salt on his fingers, and he looked down coast and up, and then they went back up the beach toward the town. They spent the afternoon drinking in a Lazarus bodega run by a Mexican. Some soldiers came in. An altercation took place.
Toadvine was on his feet, swaying. A peacemaker rose from among the soldiers, and soon the principals were seated again. But minutes later, Brown, on his way back from the bar, poured a pitcher of aguardiente over a young soldier and set him afire with his cigar. The man ran outside mute, save for the whoosh of the flames, and the flames were pale blue and then invisible in the sunlight, and he fought them in the street like a man beset with bees or madness, and then he fell over on the road and burned up. By the time they got to him with a bucket of water, he had blackened and shriveled in the mud like an enormous spider. Brown woke in a dark little cell, manacled and crazed with thirst. The first thing he consulted for was the bag of coins. It was still inside his shirt. He rose up from the straw and put one eye to the Judas hole. It was day. He called out for someone to come. He sat and with his chained hands counted out the coins and put them back in the bag. In the evening he was brought his supper by a soldier. The soldier's name was Pettit, and Brown showed him his necklace of ears, and he showed him the coins. Pettit said he wanted no part of his schemes. Brown told him how he had thirty thousand dollars buried in the desert. He told him of the ferry, installing himself in Glanton's place. He showed him the coins again, and he spoke familiarly of their places of origin, supplementing the judge's reports with impromptu data. Even shares, he hissed. You and me. He studied the recruit through the bars. Pettit wiped his forehead with his sleeve. Brown scooped the coins back into the poke and handed them out to him. You think we can't trust one another? he said. The boy stood holding the sack of coins uncertainly. He tried to push it back through the bars. Brown stepped away and held his hands up. Don't be a fool, he hissed. What do you think I'd give to have such a chance at your age? When Pettit was gone, he sat in the straw and looked at the thin metal plate of beans and the tortillas. After a while, he ate. Outside, it was raining again, and he could hear riders passing in the mud of the street, and soon it was dark. They left two nights later. They had each a passable saddle horse and a rifle and blanket, and they had a mule that carried provisions of dried corn and beef and dates. They rode up into the dripping hills, and in the first light, Brown raised the rifle and shot the boy through the back of the head. The horse lurched forward, and the boy toppled backward, the entire foreplate of his skull gone and the brains exposed. Brown halted his mount and got down and retrieved the sack of coins and took the boy's knife and took his rifle and his powder flask and his coat and he cut the ears from the boy's head and strung them onto his scapular and then he mounted up and rode on. The pack mule followed and after a while so did the horse the boy had been riding. When Webster and Toadvine rode into the camp at Yuma, they had neither provisions nor the mules they left with. Glanton took five men and rode out at dusk, leaving the judge in charge of the ferry. They reached San Diego in the dead of night and were directed to the alcalde's house. This man came to the door in nightshirt and stocking cap, holding a candle before him. Glanton pushed him back into the parlor and sent his men on to the rear of the house, from whence they heard directly a woman's screams and a few dull slaps and then silence. The alcalde was a man in his sixties, and he turned to go to his wife's aid and was struck down with a pistol barrel. He stood up again, holding his head. Glanton pushed him on to the rear room. He had in his hand a rope already fashioned into a noose and he turned the alcalde around and put the noose over his head and pulled it taut. The wife was sitting up in bed, and at this she commenced to scream again. One of her eyes was swollen and closing rapidly, and now one of the recruits hit her flush in the mouth, and she fell over in the tousled bedding and put her hands over her head. Glanton held the candle aloft and directed one of the recruits to boost the other on his shoulders and the boy reached along the top of one of the vigas until he found a space 
and he fitted the end of the rope through and let it down, and they hauled on it and raised the mute and struggling Alcalde into the air. They'd not tied his hands, and he groped wildly overhead for the rope and pulled himself up to save strangling, and he kicked his feet and revolved slowly in the candlelight. Valga me Dios, he gasped. Que quiere? I want my money, said Glanton. I want my money, and I want my pack mules, and I want David Brown. Como? wheezed the old man. Someone had lit a lamp. The old woman raised up and saw first the shadow and then the form of her husband dangling from the rope, and she began to crawl across the bed toward him. Digame! gasped the alcalde. Someone reached to seize the wife, but Glanton motioned him away, and she staggered out of the bed and took hold of her husband about the knees to hold him up. She was sobbing and praying for mercy to Glanton and to God impartially. Glanton walked around to where he could see the man's face. "'I want my money,' he said. "'My money and my mules and the man I sent out here. "'El hombre que tiene usted. "'Mi compañero.' "'No, no,' gasped the hangman. "'Buscale. No man is here.' "'Where is he?' "'He is not here.' "'Yes, he's here, in the juzgado.' "'No, no. Madre de Jesús, no here. He's gone. Siete, ocho días.' "'Where is the juzgado?' "'Como? El juzgado. Donde está?' The old woman turned loose with one arm long enough to point, her face pressed to the man's leg. Aya, she said, Aya. Two men went out, one holding the stub of the candle and shielding the flame with his cupped hand before him. When they came back, they reported the little dungeon in the building out back empty. Glanton studied the alcalde. The old woman was visibly tottering. They'd half hitch the rope about the tailpost of the bed, and he loosed the rope, and the alcalde and the wife collapsed onto the floor. They left them bound and gagged, and rode out to visit the grocer. Three days later, the alcalde and the grocer and the alcalde's wife were found tied and lying in their own excrement in an abandoned hut at the edge of the ocean eight miles south of the settlement. They'd been left a pan of water from which they drank like dogs and they had howled at the booming surf in that way-place until they were mute as stones. Glanton and his men were two days and nights in the streets, crazed with liquor. The sergeant in charge of the small garrison of American troops confronted them in a drinking exchange on the evening of the second day, and he and the three men with him were beaten senseless and stripped of their arms. At dawn, when the soldiers kicked in the hostile door, there was no one in the room. Glanton returned to Yuma alone, his men gone to the gold fields. On that bone-strewn waste he encountered wretched parcels of foot travelers who called out to him, and men dead where they'd fallen, and men who would die, and groups of folks clustered about a last wagon or cart, shouting hoarsely at the mules or oxen, and goading them on as if they bore in those frail caissons the covenant itself. And these animals would die, and the people with them. And they called out to that lone horseman to warn him of the danger at the crossing. And the horseman rode on, all contrary to the tide of refugees, like some storied hero, toward what beast of war or plague or famine with what set to his relentless jaw. When he reached Yuma, he was drunk. Behind him on a string were two small jacks laden with whiskey and biscuit. He sat his horse and looked down at the river, who was keeper of the crossroads of all that world, and his dog came to him and nuzzled his foot in the stirrup. A young Mexican girl was crouched naked under the shade of the wall. She watched him ride past, covering her breasts with her hands. She wore a rawhide collar about her neck, and she was chained to a post, and there was a clay bowl of blackened meat scraps beside her. Glanton tied the jacks to the post and rode inside on the horse. There was no one about. He rode down to the landing, 
While I was watching the river, the doctor came scrambling down the bank and seized Glanton by the foot and began to plead with him in a senseless jabber. He had not seen to his person in weeks, and he was filthy and disheveled, and he tugged at Glanton's trouser leg and pointed toward the fortifications on the hill. "'That man!' he said. "'That man!' Glanton slid his boot from the stirrup and pushed the doctor away with his foot, and turned the horse and rode back up the hill. The judge was standing on the rise in silhouette against the evening sun like some great Bolden archimandrite. He was wrapped in a mantle of free-flowing cloth, beneath which he was naked. The black man Jackson came out of one of the stone bunkers, dressed in a similar garb, and stood beside him. Glanton rode back up along the crest of the hill to his quarters. All night gunfire drifted intermittently across the water, and laughter and drunken oaths. When day broke, no one appeared. The ferry lay at its moorings, and across the river a man came down to the landing and blew a horn, and waited, and then went back. The ferry stood idle all that day. By evening the drunkenness and revelry had begun afresh, and the shrieks of young girls carried across the water to the pilgrims huddled in their camp. Someone had given the idiot whiskey mixed with sarsaparilla and this thing which could little more than walk had commenced to dance before the fire with loping simian steps, moving with great gravity and smacking its loose wet lips. At dawn the black walked out to the landing and stood urinating in the river. The scows lay downstream against the bank with a few inches of sandy water standing in the floorboards. He pulled his robes about him and stepped aboard the thwart and balanced there. The water ran over the boards toward him. He stood looking out. The sun was not up, and there was a low skein of mist on the water. Downstream some ducks moved out from the willows. They circled in the eddy water, and then flapped out across the open river, and rose and circled and bent their way upstream. In the floor of the scow was a small coin, perhaps once lodged under the tongue of some passenger. He bent to fetch it. He stood up and wiped the grit from the piece and held it up, and as he did so a long cane arrow passed through his upper abdomen and flew on and fell far out on the river and sank, and backed to the surface again and began to turn and to drift downstream. He faced around, his robe sustained about him. He was holding his wound, and with his other hand he ravaged among his clothes for the weapons that were not there, and were not there. A second arrow passed him on the left, and two more struck and lodged fast in his chest and in his groin. They were a full four feet in length, and they lofted slightly with his movements like ceremonial wands, and he seized his thigh where the dark arterial blood was spurting along the shaft and took a step toward the shore and fell sideways into the river. The water was shallow, and he was moving weakly to regain his feet when the first of the Yumas leaped aboard the scow. Completely naked, his hair dyed orange, his face painted black, with a crimson line dividing it from widow's peak to chin. He stamped his feet twice on the boards and flared his arms like some wild thaumaturge out of an atavistic drama and reached and seized the black by his robes where he lay in the reddening waters, and raised him up and stove in his head with his war club. They swarmed up the hill toward the fortifications where the Americans lay sleeping, and some were mounted and some afoot, and all of them armed with bows and clubs, and their faces blacked or pale with fard, and their hair bound up in clay. The first quarters they entered were Lincoln's, when they emerged a few minutes later, one of them carried the doctor's dripping head by the hair, and others were dragging behind them the doctor's dog, bound at the muzzle, jerking and bucking across the dry clay of the concourse. They entered a wickiup of willow poles and canvas, and slew Gunn and Wilson and Henderson Smith each in turn as they reared up drunkenly.
and they moved on among the rude half-walls in total silence, glistening with paint and grease and blood among the bands of light where the risen sun now touched the higher ground. When they entered Glanton's chamber, he lurched upright and glared wildly about him. The small clay room he occupied was entirely filled with a brass bed he'd appropriated from some migrating family, and he sat in it like a debauched feudal baron, while his weapons hung in a rich array from the finials. Caballo and Pelo mounted into the actual bed with him, and stood there, while one of the attending tribunal handed him at his right side a common axe, the hickory helve of which was carved with pagan motifs and tasseled with the feathers of predatory birds. Glanton spat. "'Hack away, you mean red nigger,' he said. And the old man raised the axe and split the head of John Joel Glanton to the thrapple. When they entered the judge's quarters, they found the idiot and a girl of perhaps twelve years cowering naked in the floor. Behind them, also naked, stood the judge. He was holding leveled at them the bronze barrel of the howitzer. The wooden truck stood on the floor, the straps pried up and twisted off the pillow blocks. The judge had the cannon under one arm, and he was holding a lighted cigar over the touch hole. The Yumas fell over one another backward, and the judge put the cigar in his mouth and took up his portmanteau and stepped out the door and backed past them and down the embankment. The idiot, who reached just to his waist, stuck close to his side, and together they entered the wood at the base of the hill and disappeared from sight. The savages built a bonfire on the hill, and fueled it with the furnishings from the white men's quarters, and they raised up Glanton's body and bore it aloft in the manner of a slain champion and hurled it onto the flames. They'd tied his dog to his corpse, and it was snatched after in howling suttee to disappear crackling in the rolling greenwood smoke. The doctor's torso was dragged up by the heels and raised and flung onto the pyre, and the doctor's mastiff also was committed to the flames. It slid, struggling down the far side, and the thongs with which it was tied must have burnt in two, for it began to crawl, charred and blind and smoking from the fire, and was flung back with a shovel. The other bodies, eight in number, were heaped onto the fire, where they sizzled and stank, and the thick smoke rolled out over the river. The doctor's head had been mounted upon a paling and carried about, but at the last it too was thrown onto the blaze. The guns and clothing were divided upon the clay, and divided too with the gold and silver out of the hacked and splintered chest that they'd dragged forth. All else was heaped on the flames, and while the sun rose and glistened on their gaudy faces, they sat upon the ground, each with his new goods before him and they watched the fire and smoked their pipes as might some painted troop of mime-folk recruiting themselves in such a way-place far from the towns and the rabble hooting at them across the smoking footlamps, contemplating towns to come, and the poor fanfare of trumpet and drum, and the rude boards upon which their destinies were inscribed, for these people were no less bound and indentured." and they watched like the prefiguration of their own ends, the carbonized skulls of their enemies incandescing before them, bright as blood among the coals. Chapter 20 The Escape Into the Desert Pursued by the Yumas A Stand Alamo Mucho Another refugee. A siege. At Long Taw. Night fires. The judge lives. At Barter in the Desert. How the ex-priest comes to advocate murder. Setting forth. Another encounter. Cariso Creek. An attack. Among the Bones.
playing for keeps. An exorcism. Tobin wounded. A counseling. The slaughter of the horses. The judge on torts. Another escape, another desert. Toadvine and the kid fought a running engagement upriver through the shore bracken, with arrows clattering through the cane all about them. They came out of the willow brakes and climbed the dunes and descended the far side and reappeared again, two dark figures anguishing upon the sands, now trotting, now stooping, the report of the pistol flat and dead in the open country. The Yumas who crested out on the dunes were four in number, and they didn't follow, but rather fixed them upon the terrain to which they had committed themselves, and then turned back. The kid carried an arrow in his leg, and it was butted against the bone. He stopped and sat and broke off the shaft a few inches from the wound, and then he got up again, and they went on. At the crest of the rise they stopped and looked back. The Yumas had already left the dunes, and they could see the smoke rising darkly along the river bluff. To the west the country was all rolling sand hills, where a man might lie in hiding, but there was no place the sun would not find him, and only the wind could hide his tracks. "'Can you walk?' said Toadvine. "'I ain't got no choice. How much water you got?' "'Not much. What do you want to do?' "'I don't know. We could ease back to the river and lay up,' said Toadvine. "'Till what?' He looked toward the fort again, and he looked at the broken shaft on the kid's leg and the welling blood. You want to try and pull that? No. What do you want to do? Go on. They mended their course and picked up the trail the wagon parties followed, and they went on through the long forenoon and the day and the evening of the day. By dark their water was gone and they labored on beneath the slow wheel of stars and slept shivering among the dunes and rose in the dawn and went on again. The kid's leg had stiffened, and he hobbled after with a section of wagon tongue for a crutch, and twice he told Toadvine to go on, but he wouldn't. Before noon, the aborigines appeared. They watched them assemble upon the trembling drop of the eastern horizon like baleful marionettes, they were without horses, and they seemed to be moving at a trot, and within the hour they were lofting arrows upon the refugees. They went on, the kid with his pistol drawn, stepping and ducking the shafts where they fell out of the sun, the lengths of them glistening against the pale sky and foreshortening in a reedy flutter, and then suddenly quivering dead in the ground. They snapped off the shafts against their being used again and they labored on sideways over the sand like crabs until the arrows coming so thick and close they made a stand. The kid dropped onto his elbows and cocked and leveled the revolver. The Yumas were over a hundred yards out, and they set up a cry, and Toadvine dropped to one knee alongside the kid. The pistol bucked, and the gray smoke hung motionless in the air, and one of the savages went down like a player through a trap. The kid had cocked the pistol again, but Toadvine put his hand over the barrel. And the kid looked up at him and lowered the hammer, and then sat and reloaded the empty chamber, and pushed himself up and recovered his crutch, and they went on. Behind them on the plain they could hear the thin clamor of the aborigines as they clustered about the one he'd shot. That painted horde dogged their steps the day long. There were twenty-four hours without water, and the barren mural of sand and sky was beginning to shimmer and swim, and the periodic arrows sprang aslant from the sands about them like the tufted stalks of mutant desert growths, propagating angrily into the dry desert air. They did not stop. When they reached the wells at Alamo Mucho, the sun was low before them, and there was a figure seated at the rim of the basin. This figure rose, 
and stood warped in the quaking lens of that world, and held out one hand, in welcome or warning they had no way to know. They shielded their eyes and limped on, and the figure at the well called out to them. It was the ex-priest Tobin. He was alone and unarmed. "'How many are ye?' he said. "'What you see,' said Toadvine. "'All the rest gone under? Ganton, the judge?' They didn't answer. They slid down to the floor of the well, where there stood a few inches of water, and they knelt and drank. The pit in which the well was sunk was perhaps a dozen feet in diameter, and they posted themselves about the inner slope of this salient and watched while the Indians fanned out over the plain, moving past in the distance at a slow lope. Assembled in small groups at cardinal points out there, they began to launch their arrows upon the defenders, and the Americans called out the arrival of the incoming shafts like artillery officers. Lying there on the exposed bank and watching out across the pit toward the assailants in that quarter, their hands clawed at either side of them and their legs cocked, rigid as cats. The kid held his fire altogether, and soon those savages on the western shore who were more favored by the light began to move in. About the well were hillocks of sand from old diggings, and the Yumas may have meant to try to reach them. The kid left his post and moved to the west rim of the excavation, and began to fire on them where they stood or squatted on their haunches like wolves out there on the shimmering pan. The ex-priest knelt by the kid's side and watched behind them, and held his hat between the sun and the foresight of the kid's pistol and the kid steadied the pistol in both hands on the edge of the works and let off the rounds. At the second fire, one of the savages fell over and lay without moving. The next shot spun another one around, and he sat down and then rose and took a few steps and sat down again. The ex-priest whispered encouragement at his elbow, and the kid thumbed back the hammer, and the ex-priest adjusted the hat to shade gun sight and sight eye with the one shadow, and the kid fired again. He had drawn his sight upon the wounded man sitting on the pan, and his shot stretched him out dead. The ex-priest gave a low whistle. Hey, you're a cool one, he whispered. But it's cunning work all the same, and wouldn't it take the heart out of you? The Yumas seemed immobilized by these misfortunes, and the kid cocked the pistol and shot down another of their number before they began to collect themselves and to move back, taking their dead with them, lofting a flurry of arrows and howling out blood oaths in their Stone Age tongue, or invocations to whatever gods of war or fortune they'd the ear of, and retreating upon the pan until they were very small indeed. The kid shouldered up his flask and shot pouch and slid down the pitch to the floor of the well, where he dug a second small basin with the old shovel there, and in the water that seeped in he washed the bores of the cylinder and washed the barrel and ran pieces of his shirt through the bore with a stick until they came clean. Then he reassembled the pistol, tapping the barrel pin until the cylinder was snug and laying the piece in the warm sand to dry. Toadvine had made his way around the excavation until he reached the ex-priest, and they lay watching the retreat of the savages through the heat shimmering off the pan in the late sunlight. He's a dead eye, ain't he? Tobin nodded. He looked down the pit to where the kids sat loading the pistol, turning the powder-filled chambers and measuring them with his eye, seating the balls with the sprues down. How do you stand by way of ammunition? Poorly. We got a few rounds, not many. The ex-priest nodded. Evening was coming on, and in the red land of the west, the Yumas were gathering in silhouette before the sun. All night their watchfires burned on the dark circlet of the world, and the kid unpinned the barrel from the pistol, and using it for a spyglass, he went around the warm sand selvage of the well and studied the separate fires for movement. There is hardly in the world a waste so barren, but some creature will not cry out at night. Yet here one was, and they listened to their breathing in the dark and the cold 
and they listened to the sistol of the ruby-meated hearts that hung within them. When day broke, the fires had burned out, and slender terminals of smoke stood from the plain at three separate points of the compass, and the enemy had gone. Crossing the dry pan toward them from the east was a large figure attended by a smaller. Toadvine and the ex-priest watched. What do you make it to be? The ex-priest shook his head. Toadvine cupped his hand and whistled sharply down at the kid. He sat up with the pistol. He clambered up the slope with his stiff leg. The three of them lay watching. It was the judge and the imbecile. They were both of them naked, and they neared through the desert dawn like beings of a mode little more than tangential to the world at large, their figures now quick with clarity and now fugitive in the strangeness of that same light, like things whose very portent renders them ambiguous, like things so charged with meaning that their forms are dimmed. The three at the well watched mutely, this transit out of the breaking day, and even though there was no longer any question as to what it was that approached, yet none would name it. They lumbered on, the judge a pale pink beneath his talc of dust like something newly born, the imbecile much the darker, lurching together across the pan at the very extremes of exile, like some scurrilous king stripped of his vestiture and driven together with his fool into the wilderness to die. Those who travel in desert places do indeed meet with creatures surpassing all description. The watchers at the well rose the better to witness these arrivals. The imbecile was fairly loping along to keep the pace, the judge on his head wore a wig of dried river mud from which protruded bits of straw and grass, and tied upon the imbecile's head was a rag of fur with the blackened blood side out. The judge carried in one hand a small canvas satchel, and he was bedraped with meat like some medieval penitent. He hove up at the diggings and nodded them a good morning, and he and the idiot slid down the bank and knelt and began to drink. Even the idiot, who must be fed by hand. He knelt beside the judge and sucked noisily at the mineral water, and raised his dark, larval eyes to the three men crouched above him at the rim of the pit, and then bent and drank again. The judge threw off his bandoliers of sun-blacked meat, and his skin beneath was strangely mottled pink and white in the shapes of them. He set by the little mud cap and laved water over his burnt and peeling skull and over his face, and he drank again and sat in the sand. He looked up at his old companions. His mouth was cracked and his tongue swollen. Lewis, he said, what will you take for that hat? Toadvine spat. It ain't for sale, he said. Everything's for sale, said the judge. What will you take? Toadvine looked uneasily at the ex-priest. He looked down into the well. Gotta have my hat, he said. How much? Toadvine gestured with his chin at the strings of meat. I reckon you want to trade some of that tug for it. Not at all, said the judge. Such as is here is for everybody. How much for the hat? What'll you give? said Toadvine. The judge studied him. I'll give one hundred dollars, he said. No one spoke. The idiot crouched on its haunches seemed also to be awaiting the outcome of this exchange. Toadvine took off the hat and looked at it. His lank black hair clove to the sides of his head. It won't fit ye he said. The judge quoted him some term in Latin. He smiled. Not your concern, he said. Toadvine put the hat on and adjusted it. I reckon that's what you got in that there satchel, he said. You reckon correctly, said the judge. Toadvine looked off toward the sun. I'll make it a hundred and a quarter, and won't ask you where you got it said the judge. 
Let's see your color. The judge unclasped the satchel and tipped and emptied it out on the sand. It contained a knife and perhaps a half a bucketful of gold coins of every value. The judge pushed the knife to one side and spread the coins with the palm of his hand and looked up. Toadvine took off the hat. He made his way down the slope. He and the judge squatted on either side of the judge's trove, and the judge put forward the coins agreed upon, advancing them with the back of his hand forward like a croupier. Toadvine handed up the hat and gathered the coins, and the judge took the knife and slit the band of the hat at the rear and cut through the brim and opened up the crown and then set the hat on his head and looked up at Tobin and the kid. Come down, he said. Come down and share this meat. They didn't move. Toadvine already had a piece of it in both hands and was tugging at it with his teeth. It was cool in the well, and the morning sun fell only upon the upper rim. The judge scooped the remaining coins back into the satchel and stood it aside and bent to drink again. The imbecile had been watching its reflection in the pool, and it watched the judge drink, and it watched the water calm itself once more. The judge wiped his mouth and looked at the figures above him. "'How are you fixed for weapons?' he said. The kid had set one foot over the edge of the pit, and now he drew it back. Tobin didn't move. He was watching the judge. "'We've just the one pistol, Holden.' "'We?' said the judge. "'The lad here.' The kid had risen to his feet again. The ex-priest stood by him. The judge in the floor of the well likewise rose, and he adjusted his hat and gripped the valise under his arm like some immense and naked barrister whom the country had crazed. "'Weigh your counsel, priest,' he said. "'We are all here together.' Yonder sun is like the eye of God, and we will cook impartially upon this great silicious griddle, I do assure you. I'm no priest, and I've no counsel, said Tobin. The lad is a free agent. The judge smiled. Quite so, he said. He looked at Toadvine, and he smiled up at the ex-priest again. What then, he said. Are we to drink at these holes, turn about like rival bands of apes? The ex-priest looked at the kid. They stood facing the sun. He squatted, the better to address the judge below. Do you think that there is a registry where you can file on the wells of the desert? Ah, priest, you know those offices more readily than I. I've no claim here. I've told you before, I'm a simple man. You know you're welcome to come down here and to drink and to fill your flask. Tobin didn't move. Let me have the canteen, said the kid. He had taken the pistol from his belt, and he handed it to the ex-priest and took the leather bottle and descended the bank. The judge followed him with his eyes. The kid circled the floor of the well, no part of which was altogether beyond the judge's reach and he knelt opposite the imbecile and pulled the stopper from the flask and submerged the flask in the basin. He and the imbecile watched the water run in at the neck of the flask, and they watched it bubble, and they watched it cease. The kid stoppered the flask and leaned and drank from the pool, and then he sat back and looked at Toadvine. "'Are you going with us?' Toadvine looked at the judge. "'I don't know,' he said. I'm subject to arrest. They'll arrest me in California. Arrest ye? Toadvine didn't answer. He was sitting in the sand, and he made a tripod of three fingers and stuck them in the sand before him, and then he lifted and turned them and poked them in again, so that there were six holes in the form of a star or a hexagon, and then he rubbed them out again. He looked up. You wouldn't think that a man would run plumb out of country out here, would you? The kid rose and slung the flask by its strap over his shoulder. His trouser leg was black with blood, and the bloody stump of the shaft jutted from his thigh like a peg for hanging implements upon. <laughs>
He spat and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand, and he looked at Toadvine. It ain't country you've run out of, he said. Then he made his way across the sink and up the bank. The judge followed him with his eyes, and when the kid reached the sunlight at the top, he turned and looked back, and the judge was holding open the satchel between his naked thighs. Five hundred dollars, he said, powder and ball included. The ex-priest was at the kid's side. Do him, he hissed. The kid took the pistol, but the ex-priest clung to his arm, whispering. And when the kid pulled away, he spoke aloud. Such was his fear. You'll get no second chance, lad. Do it. He's naked. He's unarmed. God's blood. Do you think you'll best him any other way? Do it, lad. Do it for the love of God. Do it, or I swear your life is forfeit. The judge smiled. He tapped his temple. The priest, he said. The priest has been too long in the sun. Seven fifty, that's my best offer. It's a seller's market. The kid put the pistol in his belt. Then, with the ex-priest at his elbow importunate, he circled the crater, and they set out west across the pan. Toadvine climbed up and watched them. After a while, there was nothing to see. That day their way took them upon a vast mosaic pavement cobbled up from tiny blocks of jasper, carnelian, agate. A thousand acres wide where the wind sang in the groutless interstices. Traversing this ground toward the east, riding one horse and leading another, came David Brown. The horse he led was saddled and bridled, and the kid stood with his thumbs in his belt and watched while he rode up and looked down at his old companions. "'We heard you were in the Husgado, said Tobin. "'I was,' said Brown. "'I ain't now.' His eyes catalogued them in every part. He looked at the piece of arrow shaft protruding from the kid's leg, and he looked into the ex-priest's eyes. "'Where's your outfits?' he said. "'You're looking at him. "'You fall out with Glanton?' Glanton's dead. Brown spat a dry white spot in that vast and broken plateland. He had a small stone in his mouth against the thirst, and he shifted it with his jaw and looked at them. The Yumas, he said. Aye, said the ex-priest. All rubbed out? Toadvine and the judge are at the well back yonder. The judge, said Brown. The horses stared bleakly at the crazed stone floor whereon they stood. The rest gone under? Smith? Dorsey? The nigger? All, said Tobin. Brown looked east across the desert. How far to the well? We left about an hour past daybreak. Is he armed? He is not. He studied their faces. The priests don't lie, he said. No one spoke. He sat fingering the scapular of dried ears. Then he turned the horse and rode on, leading the riderless animal behind. He rode, watching back at them. Then he stopped again. Did you see him dead? he called. Glanton? I did, called the ex-priest, for he had so. He rode on, turned slightly in the saddle, the rifle on his knee. He kept watch behind him on those pilgrims, and they on him. When he was well diminished on the pan, they turned and went on. By noon the day following, they had begun to come again upon abandoned gear from the caravans, cast shoes and pieces of harness and bones, and the dried carcasses of mules with the alparejas still buckled about. They trod the faint arc of an ancient lake shore, where broken shells lay like bits of pottery, frail and ribbed among the sands, and in the early evening they descended among a series of dunes and spoil banks to Cariso Creek, a seep that welled out of the stones and ran off down the desert and vanished again. <laughs> 
Thousands of sheep had perished here, and the travelers made their way among the yellowed bones and carcasses with their rags of tattered wool, and they knelt among the bones to drink. When the kid raised his dripping head from the water, a rifle ball dished his reflection from the pool, and the echoes of the shot clattered about the bone-strewn slopes and clanged away in the desert and died. He spun on his belly and clambered sideways, scanning the skyline. He saw the horses first, standing nose to nose in a notch among the dunes to the south. He saw the judge, clad in the gusseted clothing of his recent associates. He was holding the mouth of the upright rifle in his fist and pouring powder from a flask down the bore. The imbecile, naked save for a hat, squatted in the sands at his feet. The kid scuttled to a low place in the ground and lay flat with the pistol in his fist and the creek trickling past his elbow. He turned to look for the ex-priest, but he could not find him. He could see through the lattice of bones the judge and his charge on the hill in the sun, and he raised the pistol and rested it in the saddle of a rancid pelvis and fired. He saw the sand jump on the slope behind the judge and the judge leveled the rifle and fired, and the rifle ball whacked through the bones, and the shots rolled away over the dune lands. The kid lay with his heart hammering in the sand. He thumbed back the hammer again and raised his head. The idiot sat as before, and the judge was trudging sedately along the skyline, looking over the wind-road bones below him for an advantage. The kid began to move again. He moved into the creek on his belly and lay drinking, holding up the pistol and the powder flask and sucking at the water. Then he moved out the far side and down a trampled corridor through the sands where wolves had gone to and fro. Off to his left he thought he heard the ex-priest hiss at him, and he could hear the creek, and he lay listening. He set the hammer at half-cock and rotated the cylinder and recharged the empty chamber and capped the piece and raised up to look. The shallow ridge along which the judge had advanced was empty, and the two horses were coming toward him across the sand to the south. He cocked the pistol and lay watching. They approached freely over the barren pitch, nudging the air with their heads, their tails whisking. Then he saw the idiot shambling along behind them, like some dim Neolithic herdsman. To his right he saw the judge appear from the dunes and reconnoiter, and drop from sight again. The horses continued on, and there was a scrabbling behind him, and when the kid turned, the ex-priest was in the corridor hissing at him. "'Shoot him!' he called. The kid spun about to look for the judge, but the ex-priest called again in his hoarse whisper, "'The fool! Shoot the fool!' He raised his pistol. The horses stepped one and the next through a break in the yellowed palings, and the imbecile shambled after and disappeared. He looked back at Tobin, but the ex-priest was gone. He moved along the corridor until he came to the creek again, already slightly roiled from the drinking horses above him. His leg had begun to bleed, and he lay soaking it in the cold water, and he drank and palmed water over the back of his neck. The marblings of blood that swung from his thigh were like thin red leeches in the current. He looked at the sun. Hello, called the judge, his voice off to the west, as if they were new riders to the creek, and he addressed them. The kid lay listening. There were no new riders. After a while, the judge called out again. Come out, he called. There's plenty of water for everybody. The kid had swung the powder flask around to his back to keep it out of the creek, and he held the pistol up and waited. Upstream, the horses had stopped drinking. Then they started drinking again. When he moved out on the far side of the creek, he came upon the hand and foot tracks left by the ex-priest among the prints of cats and foxes and the little desert pigs. He entered a clearing in that senseless midden and sat listening. His leather clothes were heavy and stiff with water, and his leg was throbbing. 
A horse's head came up streaming water at the muzzle a hundred feet away over the bones and dropped from sight again. When the judge called out, his voice was in a new place. He called out for them to be friends. The kid watched a small caravan of ants bearing off among the arches of sheep ribs. In the watching, his eyes met the eyes of a small viper coiled under a flap of hide. He wiped his mouth and began to move again. In a cul-de-sac, the tracks of the ex-priest terminated and came back. He lay listening. It was hours till dark. After a while, he heard the idiot slobbering somewhere among the bones. He heard the wind coming in off the desert, and he heard his own breathing. When he raised his head to look out, he saw the ex-priest stumbling among the bones and holding aloft a cross he'd fashioned out of the shins of a ram, and he'd lashed them together with strips of hide, and he was holding the thing before him like some mad dowser in the bleak of desert and calling out in a tongue both alien and extinct. The kid stood up, the revolver in both hands. He wheeled. He saw the judge, and the judge was in another quarter altogether, and he had the rifle already at his shoulder. When he fired, Tobin turned around, facing the way he'd come, and sat down, still holding the cross. The judge put down the rifle and took up another. The kid tried to steady the barrel of the pistol, and he let off the shot and then dropped the sand. The heavy ball of the rifle passed overhead like an asteroid, and chattered and chopped among the bones fanned over the rise of ground beyond. He raised to his knees and looked for the judge, but the judge was not there. He reloaded the empty chamber and began to move again on his elbows toward the spot where he'd seen the ex-priest fall, taking his bearings by the sun and pausing from time to time to listen. The ground was trampled with the tracks of predators come in from the plains for the carrion, and the wind carrying through the brakes bore with it a sour reek, like the stink of a rancid dishclout, and there was no sound except the wind anywhere at all. He found Tobin kneeling in the creek, bathing his wound with a piece of linen torn from his shirt. The ball had passed completely through his neck. It had narrowly missed the carotid artery, yet he could not make the blood to stop. He looked at the kid, crouched among the skulls and upturned rib tines. "'You've got to kill the horses,' he said. "'You've no other chance out of here. He'll ride you down. "'We could take the horses.' Don't be a fool, lad. What other bait has he? We can get out of here as soon as it comes dark. Do you think there'll be no day again? The kid watched him. Will it not stop? He said. It will not. What do you think? I've got to stop it. The blood was running between his fingers. Where's the judge? Said the kid. Where, indeed... If I kill him, we can take the horses. You'll not kill him. Don't be a fool. Shoot the horses. The kid looked off up the shallow, sandy creek. Go on, lad. He looked at the ex-priest and at the slow gouts of blood dropping in the water, like rose blooms, how they swelled and were made pale. He moved away up the creek. When he came to where the horses had entered the water, they were gone. The sand on the side where they'd gone out was still wet. He pushed the revolver along before him, moving on the heels of his hands. For all his caution, he found the idiot watching him before he ever saw it. It was sitting motionless in a bower of bones, with the broken sunlight stenciled over its vacant face, and it was watching like a wild thing in a wood. The kid looked at it, and then he shoved on past in the tracks of the horses. The loose neck swiveled slowly, and the dull jaw drooled. When he looked back, it was still watching. Its wrists were lying in the sand before it, and although there was no expression to its face, yet it seemed a creature beset with a great woe. When he saw the horses, they were standing on a rise of ground above the creek and looking toward the west. He lay quietly and studied the terrain. Then he moved out along the edge of the wash and sat with his back to the bone salience and cocked the pistol 
and took a rest with his elbows on his knees. The horses had seen him come out of the wash, and they were watching him. When they heard the pistol cock, they pricked their ears and began to walk toward him across the sand. He shot the forward horse in the chest, and it fell over and lay breathing heavily, with the blood running out of its nose. The other one stopped and stood uncertainly, and he cocked the pistol and shot it as it turned. It began to trot among the dunes, and he shot it again, and its front legs buckled and it pitched forward and rolled onto its side. It raised its head once, and then it lay still. He sat listening. Nothing moved. The first horse lay as it had fallen, the sand about its head darkening with blood. The smoke drifted away down the draw and thinned and vanished. He moved back down the wash and crouched under the ribs of a dead mule and recharged the pistol and then moved on toward the creek again. He did not go back the way he'd come, and he did not see the imbecile again. When he came to the creek, he drank and bathed his leg and lay listening as before. "'Throw that gun out now,' said the judge. He froze. The voice was not fifty feet away. "'I know what you've done. The priest put you up to it, and I'll take that as a mitigation in the act and the intent, which I would any man in his wrongdoing.' But there's the question of property. You bring me the pistol now. The kid lay without moving. He heard the judge wade the creek upstream. He lay counting slowly under his breath. When the roiled water reached him, he stopped counting and let go on the current a dry twist of grass and told it away downstream. At that same count, it was scarcely out of sight among the bones. He moved out of the water and looked at the sun and began to make his way back to where he'd left Tobin. He found the ex-priest's tracks still wet where he'd left the creek and the way of his progress marked with blood. He followed through the sand until he came to that place where the ex-priest had circled upon himself and lay hissing at him from his place of cover. Did you do for them, lad? He raised his hand. I, I heard the shots, all three. The fool as well, I eh, lad? He didn't answer. Good lad, hissed the ex-priest. He'd bound up his neck in his shirt, and he was naked to the waist, and he squatted among those rancid pickets and eyed the sun. The shadows were long on the dunes, and in the shadow... The bones of the beasts that had died there lay skewed in a curious congress of garbled armatures upon the sands. They'd close to two hours till dark, and the ex-priest said so. They lay under the board-like hide of a dead ox and listened to the judge calling to them. He called out points of jurisprudence. He cited cases. He expounded upon those laws pertaining to property rights in Beast Men's Suite and he quoted from cases of attainder, insofar as he reckoned them germane to the corruption of blood in the prior and felonious owners of the horses now dead among the bones. Then he spoke of other things. The ex-priest leaned to the kid. Don't listen, he said. I ain't listening. Stop your ears. Stop yours. The priest cupped his hands over his ears and looked at the kid. His eyes were bright from the blood loss, and he was possessed of a great earnestness. Do it, he whispered. Do you think he speaks to me? The kid turned away. He marked the sun squatting at the western rim of the waste, and they spoke no more until it was dark. And then they rose and made their way out. They stole up from the basin and set off across the shallow dunes, and they looked a last time back at the valley, where, flickering in the wind at the edge of the revetment, stood the judge's night fire for all to see. They didn't speculate as to what it fed upon for fuel, and they were well advanced on the desert before the moon rose. <laughs>
There were wolves and jackals in that region, and they cried all the fore part of the night until the moon came up, and then they ceased as if surprised by its rising. Then they began again. The pilgrims were weak from their wounds. They lay down to rest, but never for long, and never without scanning the skyline to the east for any figure intruded upon it. And they shivered in the barren desert wind coming out of whatever godless quadrant, cold and sterile, and bearing news of nothing at all. When day came, they made their way to a slight rise on that endless flat, and squatted in the loose shale and watched the sun's rising. It was cold, and the ex-priest in his rags and his collar of blood hugged himself. On this small promontory they slept, and when they woke it was mid-morning and the sun well advanced. They sat up and looked out. Coming toward them over the plain in the middle distance, they could see the figure of the judge, the figure of the fool. Chapter 21 Desert Castaways The Backtrack A Hideout The Wind Takes a Side The Judge Returns An Address Los Digenos San Felipe Hospitality of the Savages Into the Mountains Grizzlies San Diego The Sea The kid looked at Tobin, but the ex-priest sat without expression. He was drawn and wretched-looking, and the approaching travelers seemed to evoke in him no recognition. He raised his head slightly, and he spoke without looking at the kid. "'Go on,' he said. "'Save yourself.' The kid took the water bottle from the shales and unstoppered it and drank and handed it across. The ex-priest drank and they sat watching, and then they rose and turned and set out again. They were much reduced by their wounds and their hunger, and they made a poor show as they staggered onward. By noon their water was gone, and they sat studying the barrenness about. A wind blew down from the north. Their mouths were dry. The desert upon which they were entrained was desert absolute, and it was devoid of feature altogether, and there was nothing to mark their progress upon it. The earth fell away on every side equally in its architecture, and by these limits were they circumscribed, and of them were they locusts. They rose and went on. The sky was luminous. There was no trace to follow other than the bits of cast-off left by travelers even to the bones of men drifted out of their graves in the scalloped sands. In the afternoon the terrain began to rise before them, and at the crest of a shallow esker they stood and looked back to see the judge much as before, some two miles distant on the plain. They went on. The approach to any watering place in that desert was marked by the carcasses of perished animals in increasing number, and so it was now as if the wells were ringed about by some hazard lethal to creatures. The travelers looked back. The judge was out of sight beyond the rise. Before them lay the whitened boards of a wagon, and further on the shapes of mule and ox, with the hide scoured bald as canvas by the constant abrasion of the sand. The kid stood studying this place, and then he backtracked some hundred yards and stood looking down at his shallow footprints in the sand. He looked upon the drifted slope of the esker which they had descended, and he knelt and held his hand against the ground, and he listened to the faint silica hiss of the wind. When he lifted his hand, there was a thin ridge of sand that had drifted against it, and he watched this ridge slowly vanish before him. The ex-priest, when he returned to him, presented a grave appearance. The kid knelt and studied him where he sat. "'We gotta hide,' he said. "'Hide? Yes. Where do you aim to hide? Here. We'll hide here.' 
You can't hide, lad. We can hide. You think he can't follow your track? The wind's taking it. It's gone from the slope yonder. Gone. Ever trace. The ex-priest shook his head. Come on, we gotta get going. You can't hide. Get up. The ex-priest shook his head. Ah, lad, he said. Get up, said the kid. Go on, go on. He waved his hand. The kid spoke to him. He ain't nothing. You told me so yourself. Men are made of the dust of the earth. You said it was no pair... Pair... Parable. No parable. That it was a naked fact, and the judge was a man like all men. Face him down, then, said the ex-priest. Face him down, if he is so. And him with a rifle, and me with a pistol? Him with two rifles? Get up from there. Tobin rose. He stood unsteadily. He leaned against the kid. They set out, veering off from the drifted track and down past the wagon. They passed the first of the racks of bones and went on to where a pair of mules lay dead in the traces. And here the kid knelt with a piece of board and began to scoop them a shelter, watching the skyline to the east as he worked. Then they lay prone in the lee of those sour bones like sated scavengers and awaited the arrival of the judge and the passing of the judge if he would so pass. They'd not long to wait. He appeared upon the rise and paused momentarily before starting down, he and his drooling mansible. The ground before him was drifted and rolling, and although it could be fairly reconnoitered from the rise, the judge did not scan the country, nor did he seem to miss the fugitives from his purview. He descended the ridge and started across the flats, the idiot before him on a leather lead. He carried the two rifles that had belonged to Brown, and he wore a pair of canteens crossed upon his chest, and he carried a powder horn and flask and his portmanteau and a canvas rucksack that must have belonged to Brown also. More strangely, he carried a parasol made from rotted scraps of hide stretched over a framework of rib bones, bound with strips of tug. The handle had been the foreleg of some creature, and the judge approaching was clothed in little more than confetti, so rent was his costume to accommodate his figure. Bearing before him that morbid umbrella with the idiot in its rawhide collar pulling at the lead, he seemed some degenerate entrepreneur fleeing from a medicine show and the outrage of the citizens who'd sacked it. They advanced across the flats, and the kid on his belly in the sand wallow watched them through the ribs of the dead mules. He could see his own tracks and Tobin's coming across the sand, dim and rounded, but tracks for that. And he watched the judge and he watched the tracks, and he listened to the sand moving on the desert floor. The judge was perhaps a hundred yards out when he stopped and surveyed the ground. The idiot squatted on all fours and leaned into the lead like some naked species of lemur. It swung its head and sniffed at the air, as if it were being used for tracking. It had lost its hat, or perhaps the judge had replevant it for he now wore a rough and curious pair of pamputis cut from a piece of hide and strapped to the soles of his feet with wrappings of hemp salvaged from some desert wreck. The imbecile lunged in its collar and croaked, its forearms dangling at its chest. When they passed the wagon and continued on, the kid knew they were beyond the point where he and Tobin had turned off from the trace. He looked at the tracks faint shapes that backed across the sands and vanished. The ex-priest at his side seized his arm and hissed and gestured toward the passing judge, and the wind rattled the scraps of hide at the carcass, and the judge and the idiot passed on across the sands and disappeared from sight. They lay without speaking. The ex-priest raised himself slightly and looked out, and he looked at the kid. The kid lowered the hammer of the pistol.
You'll get no such chance as that again. The kid put the pistol in his belt and rose onto his knees and looked out. And what now? The kid didn't answer. He'll be waiting at the next well. Let him wait. We could go back to the creek. And do what? Wait for a party to come through. Through from where? There ain't no ferry. There's game comes to the creek. Tobin was looking out through the bones and hide. When the kid didn't answer, he looked up. We could go there, he said. I got four rounds, the kid said. He rose and looked out across the scavenged ground, and the ex-priest rose and looked with him. What they saw was the judge returning. The kid swore and dropped to his belly. The ex-priest crouched. They pushed down into the wallow, and with their chins in the sand like lizards, they watched the judge traverse again the grounds before them. With his leashed fool and his equipage and the parasol dripping in the wind like a great black flower, he passed among the wreckage until he was again upon the slope of the sand esker. At the crest he turned, and the imbecile squatted at his knees, and the judge lowered the parasol before him and addressed the countryside about. "'The priest has led you to this, boy. I know you would not hide. I know, too, that you've not the heart of a common assassin. I've passed before your gun sights twice this hour, and will pass a third time. Why not show yourself?' "'No assassin!' called the judge. And no partisan either. There's a flawed place in the fabric of your heart. Do you think I could not know? You alone were mutinous. You alone reserved in your soul some corner of clemency for the heathen. The imbecile stood and raised its hands to its face and yammered weirdly and sat again. You think I've killed Brown and Toadvine? They are alive as you and me. They are alive and in possession of the fruits of their election. Do you understand? Ask the priest. The priest knows. The priest does not lie. The judge raised the parasol and adjusted his parcels. Perhaps, he called, perhaps you have seen this place in a dream that you would die here. Then he descended the esker and passed once more across the boneyard, led by the tethered fool, until the two were shimmering and insubstantial in the waves of heat, and then they were gone altogether. They would have died if the Indians had not found them. All the early part of the night they'd kept Sirius at their left on the southwest horizon, and Cetus out there fording the void, and Orion and Betelgeuse turning overhead, and they had slept curled and shivering in the darkness of the plains, and woke to find the heavens all changed, and the stars by which they'd traveled not to be found, as if their sleep had encompassed whole seasons. In the auburn dawn they saw the half-naked savages crouched or standing all in a row along the rise to the north. They got up and went on, their shadows so long and so narrow, raising with mock stealth each thin articulated leg. The mountains to the west were whited out against the daybreak. The aborigines moved along the sand ridge. After a while the ex-priest sat down and the kids stood over him with the pistol, and the savages came down from the dunes and approached by starts and checks across the plain like painted sprites. They were degenuous. They were armed with short bows, and they drew about the travelers and knelt and gave them water out of a gourd. They'd seen such pilgrims before, and with sufferings more terrible. They eked a desperate living from that land and they knew that nothing excepting some savage pursuit could drive men to such plight. 
and they watched each day for that thing to gather itself out of its terrible incubation in the house of the sun and muster along the edge of the eastern world, and whether it be armies or plague or pestilence or something altogether unspeakable, they waited with a strange equanimity. They led the refugees into their camp at San Felipe, a collection of crude huts made from reeds, and housing a population of filthy and beggarly creatures dressed largely in the cotton shirts of the Argonauts who'd passed there. Shirts and nothing more. They fetched them a stew of lizards and pocket mice, hot in clay bowls, and a sort of pignoli made from dried and pounded grasshoppers, and they crouched about and watched them with great solemnity as they ate. One reached and touched the grips of the pistol in the kid's belt and drew back again. Pistola, he said. The kid ate. The savages nodded. Quiero mirar su pistola, the man said. The kid didn't answer. When the man reached for the pistol, he intercepted his hand and put it from him. When he turned loose, the man reached again, and the kid pushed his hand away again. The man grinned. He reached a third time. The kid set the bowl between his legs and drew the pistol and cocked it and put the muzzle against the man's forehead. They sat quite still. The others watched. After a while, the kid lowered the pistol and let down the hammer and put it in his belt and picked up the bowl and commenced eating again. The man gestured toward the pistol and spoke to his friends, and they nodded, and then they sat as before. ¿Qué pasó con ustedes? The kid watched the man over the rim of the bowl with his dark and hollow eyes. The Indian looked at the ex-priest. ¿Qué pasó con ustedes? The ex-priest in his black and crusted cravat turned his whole torso to look at the man who'd spoken. He looked at the kid. He'd been eating with his fingers, and he licked them and wiped them on the filthy leg of his trousers. Las yumas, he said. They sucked in air and clucked their tongues. Son muy amados, said the speaker. Claro. No tiene compañeros? The kid and the ex-priest eyed each other. Si, sí, said the kid. Muchos. He waved his hand to the east. Llegarán. Muchos compañeros. The Indians received this news without expression. A woman brought more of the piñole, but they had been without food too long to have appetites, and they waved her away. In the afternoon they bathed in the creek and slept on the ground. When they woke they were being watched by a group of naked children and a few dogs. When they went up through the camp, they saw the Indians sitting along a ledge of rock, watching tirelessly the land to the east for whatever might come out of it. No one spoke to them of the judge, and they didn't ask. The dogs and children followed them out of the camp, and they took the trail up into the low hills to the west, where the sun was already going. They reached Warner's Ranch late the following day and they restored themselves at the hot sulfur springs there. There was no one about. They moved on. The country to the west was rolling and grassy, and beyond were mountains running to the coast. They slept that night among dwarf cedars, and in the morning the grass was frozen. And they could hear the wind in the frozen grass, and they could hear the cries of birds that seemed to charm against the sullen shores of the void out of which they had ascended. All that day they climbed through a highland park forested with Joshua trees, and rimmed about by bald granite peaks. In the evening flocks of eagles went up through the pass before them, and they could see on those grassy benches the great shambling figures of bears— like cattle, grazing on some upland heath. There were skifts of snow in the lee of the stone ledges, and in the night a light snow fell upon them. Reefs of mist were blowing across the slopes when they set out shivering in the dawn, and in the new snow they saw the tracks of the bears that had come down to take their wind just before daylight.' 
That day there was no sun, only a paleness in the haze, and the country was white with frost, and the shrubs were like polar isomers of their own shapes. Wild rams ghosted away up those rocky drawers, and the wind swirled down cold and gray from the snowy reeks above them, a smoking region of wild vapors blowing down through the gap as if the world up there were all afire. They spoke less and less between them until at last they were silent altogether, as is often the way with travelers approaching the end of a journey. They drank from the cold mountain streams and bathed their wounds, and they shot a young doe at a spring and ate what they could and smoked thin sheets of the meat to carry with them. Although they saw no more bears, they saw sign of their vicinity, and they moved off over the slopes a good mile from their meat camp before they put down for the night. In the morning they crossed a bed of thunderstones clustered on that heath like the ossified eggs of some primal ground bird. They trod the shadow line under the mountains, keeping just in the sun for the warmth of it, and that afternoon they first saw the sea, far below them, blue and serene under clouds. The trail went down through the low hills and picked up the wagon track and they followed where the locked wheels had skidded and the iron tires scarred the rock, and the sea down there darkened to black, and the sun fell, and all the land about went blue and cold. They slept shivering under a wooded boss among owl cries and a scent of juniper, while the stars swarmed in the bottomless night. It was evening of the following day when they entered San Diego. The ex-priest turned off to find them a doctor. But the kid wandered on through the raw mud streets and out past the houses of Hyde in their rows and across the gravel strand to the beach. Loose strands of amber-colored kelp lay in a rubbery rack at the tide line. A dead seal. Beyond the inner bay, part of a reef in a thin line, like something founded there on which the sea was teething. He squatted in the sand and watched the sun on the hammered face of the water. Out there island clouds emplained upon a salmon-colored other sea. Seafowl in silhouette. Downshore the dull surf boomed. There was a horse standing there, staring out upon the darkening waters, and a young colt that cavorted and trotted off and came back. He sat watching while the sun dipped, hissing in the swells. The horse stood darkly against the sky. The surf boomed in the dark, and the sea's black hide heaved in the cobbled starlight, and the long, pale combers loped out of the night and broke along the beach. He rose and turned toward the lights of the town. The tide pools bright as smelter pots among the dark rocks where the phosphorescent sea crabs clambered back. Passing through the salt grass, he looked back. The horse hadn't moved. A ship's light winked in the swells. The colt stood against the horse with its head down, and the horse was watching out there past men's knowing, where the stars are drowning and whales ferry their vast souls through the black and seamless sea. Chapter 22 Under Arrest The Judge Pays a Call An Arraignment Soldier, Priest, Magistrate On His Own Recognizance He Sees a Surgeon The Arrow Shaft Removed from His Leg Delirium He Journeys to Los Angeles A Public Hanging Los Ahorcados Looking for the ex-priest. Another fool. The scapular. To Sacramento. A traveler in the West. He abandons his party. The penitent brothers. The death cart. Another massacre. The eldress in the rocks. <laughs>
Going back through the streets, past the yellow window lights and barking dogs, he encountered a detachment of soldiers, but they took him for an older man in the dark and passed on. He entered a tavern and sat in a darkened corner, watching the groups of men at the tables. No one asked him what he wanted in that place. He seemed to be waiting for someone to come for him, and after a while, four soldiers entered and arrested him. They didn't even ask his name. In his cell, he began to speak with a strange urgency of things few men have seen in a lifetime, and his jailer said that his mind had become uncottered by the acts of blood in which he had participated. One morning he woke to find the judge standing at his cage, hat in hand, smiling down at him. He was dressed in a suit of gray linen, and he wore new polished boots. His coat was unbuttoned, and in his waistcoat he carried a watch chain and a stick pin, and in his belt a leather-covered clip that held a small silver-mounted derringer stocked in rosewood. He looked down the hallway of the crude mud building and donned the hat and smiled again at the prisoner. Well, he said, how are you? The kid didn't answer. They wanted to know from me if you were always crazy, said the judge. They said it was the country. The country turned them out. Where's Tobin? I told them that the Cretan had been a respected doctor of divinity from Harvard College as recently as March of this year, that his wits had stood him as far west as the Aquarius Mountains. It was the ensuing country that carried them off, together with his clothes. And Toadvine and Brown, where are they? In the desert, where you left them. A cruel thing, your companions in arms. The judge shook his head. What do they aim to do with me? I believe it is their intention to hang you. What did you tell them? Told them the truth, that you were the person responsible. Not that we have all the details. But they understand that it was you and none other who shaped events along such a calamitous course eventuating in the massacre at the ford by the savages with whom you conspired. Means and ends are of little moment here, idle speculations. But even though you carry the draft of your murderous plan with you to the grave, it will nonetheless be known in all its infamy to your maker. And as that is so, so shall it be made known to the least of men, all in the fullness of time. You're the one that's crazy, said the kid. The judge smiled. No, he said. It was never me. But why lurk there in the shadows? Come here, where we can talk, you and me. The kid stood against the far wall, hardly more than a shadow himself. Come up, said the judge. Come up, for I've yet more to tell you. He looked down the hallway. Don't be afraid, he said. I'll speak softly. It's not for the world's ears, but for yours only. Let me see you. Don't you know that I'd have loved you like a son? He reached through the bars. Come here, he said. Let me touch you. The kid stood with his back to the wall. Come here, if you're not afraid, whispered the judge. I ain't afraid of you. The judge smiled. He spoke softly into the dim mud cubicle. You came forward, he said, to take part in a work. But you were a witness against yourself. You sat in judgment on your own deeds. You put your own allowances before the judgments of history and you broke with the body of which you were pledged a part, and poisoned it in all its enterprise. Hear me, man. I spoke in the desert for you, and you only, and you turned a deaf ear to me. If war is not holy, man is nothing but antique clay. Even the Cretan acted in good faith, according to his parts, 
for it was required of no man to give more than he possessed, nor was any man's share compared to another's. Only each was called upon to empty out his heart into the common, and one did not. Can you tell me who that one was? It was you, whispered the kid. You were the one. The judge watched him through the bars. He shook his head. What joins men together, he said, is not the sharing of bread, but the sharing of enemies. But if I was your enemy, with whom would you have shared me? With whom? The priest? Where is he now? Look at me. Our animosities were formed and waiting before ever we two met. Yet even so, you could have changed it all. You, said the kid. It was you. It was never me, said the judge. Listen to me. Do you think Glanton was a fool? Don't you know that he'd have killed you? Lies, the kid said. Lies, by God, lies. Think again, said the judge. He never took part in your craziness. The judge smiled. He took his watch from his waistcoat and opened it and held it to the failing light. For even if you should have stood your ground, he said, yet what ground was it? He looked up. He pressed the case shut and restored the instrument to his person. Time to be going, he said. I have errands. The kid closed his eyes. When he opened them, the judge was gone. That night he called the corporal to him, and they sat on either side of the bars while the kid told the soldier of the hoard of gold and silver coins hid in the mountains not far from this place. He talked for a long time. The corporal had set the candle on the floor between them, and he watched him, as one might watch a glib and lying child. When he was finished, the corporal rose and took the candle with him, leaving him in darkness. He was released two days later. A Spanish priest had come to baptize him and had flung water at him through the bars like a priest casting out spirits. An hour later, when they came for him, he grew giddy with fear. He was taken before the alcalde, and this man spoke to him in a fatherly manner in the Spanish language, and then he was turned out into the streets. The doctor that he found was a young man of good family from the east. He cut open his trouser leg with scissors and looked at the blackened shaft of the arrow and moved it about. A soft fistula had formed about it. Do you have any pain? he said. The kid didn't answer. He pressed about the wound with his thumb. He said that he could perform the surgery and that it would cost one hundred dollars. The kid rose from the table and limped out. The day following, as he sat in the plaza, a boy came and led him again to the shack behind the hotel, and the doctor told him that they would operate in the morning. He sold the pistol to an Englishman for forty dollars, and woke at dawn in a lot underneath some boards where he'd crawled in the night. It was raining, and he went down through the empty mud streets and hammered at the grocer's door until the man let him in. When he appeared at the surgeon's office, he was very drunk, holding onto the door jamb, a quart bottle half full of whiskey clutched in his hand. The surgeon's assistant was a student from Sinaloa, who had apprenticed himself here. An altercation ensued at the door until the surgeon himself came from the rear of the premises. "'You'll have to come back tomorrow,' he said. "'I don't aim to be no soberer then.' The surgeon studied him. All right, he said. Let me have the whiskey. He entered, and the apprentice shut the door behind him. You won't need the whiskey, said the doctor. Let me have it. Why won't I need it? We have spirits of ether. You won't need the whiskey. Is it stronger? Much stronger. In any case, I can't operate on a man and him dead drunk.' 
He looked at the assistant, and then he looked at the surgeon. He set the bottle on the table. Good, said the surgeon. I want you to go with Marcello. He will draw you a bath and give you clean linen and show you to a bed. He pulled his watch from his vest and held it in his palm and read it. It is a quarter past eight. We'll operate at one. Get some rest. If you require anything, please let us know. The assistant led him across the courtyard to a whitewashed adobe building in the rear, a bay that held four iron beds, all empty. He bathed in a large riveted copper boiler that looked to have been salvaged from a ship, and he lay on the rough mattress and listened to children playing somewhere beyond the wall. He did not sleep. When they came for him, he was still drunk. He was led out and laid on a trestle in an empty room adjoining the bay, and the assistant pressed an icy cloth to his nose and told him to breathe deeply. In that sleep, and in sleeps to follow, the judge did visit. Who would come other? A great shambling mutant, silent and serene. Whatever his antecedents, he was something wholly other than their sum. Nor was there system by which to divide him back into his origins, for he would not go. Whoever would seek out his history through what unraveling of loins and ledger books must stand at last darkened and dumb at the shore of a void without terminus or origin. And whatever science he might bring to bear upon the dusty primal matter blowing down out of the millennia, will discover no trace of any ultimate atavistic egg by which to reckon his commencing. In the white and empty room he stood in his bespoken suit, with his hat in his hand, and he peered down with his small and lashless pig's eyes, wherein this child, just sixteen years on earth, could read whole bodies of decisions not accountable to the courts of men. And he saw his own name, which nowhere else could he have ciphered out at all, logged into the records as a thing already accomplished. A traveler known in jurisdictions existing only in the claims of certain pensioners or on old dated maps. In his delirium he ransacked the linens of his palate for arms, but there were none. The judge smiled. The fool was no longer there, but another man. And this other man he could never see in his entirety, but he seemed an artisan and a worker in metal. The judge enshadowed him where he crouched at his trade, but he was a cold forger who worked with hammer and die, perhaps under some indictment, and an exile from men's fires, hammering out like his own conjectural destiny all through the night of his becoming some coinage for a dawn that would not be. It is this false moneyer, with his gravers and burins, who seeks favor with the judge, and he is contriving from cold slag, brute in the crucible, a face that will pass, an image that will render this residual specie current in the markets where men barter. Of this is the judge judge, and the night does not end. The light in the room altered, a door closed. He opened his eyes. His leg was swathed in sheeting, and it was propped up with small rolls of reed matting. He was desperate with thirst, and his head was booming, and his leg was like an evil visitant in the bed with him, such was the pain. By and by the assistant came with water for him. He did not sleep again. The water that he drank ran out through his skin and drenched the bedding, and he lay without moving, as if to outwit the pain, and his face was gray and drawn, and his long hair damp and matted. A week more, and he was hobbling through the town on crutches provided him by the surgeon. He inquired at every door for news of the ex-priest, but no one knew him. In June of that year he was in Los Angeles, quartered in a hostel that was no more than a common doss house, he and forty other men of every nationality. On the morning of the eleventh all rose up still in darkness and turned out to witness a public hanging at the castle 
When he arrived, it was paling light, and already such a horde of spectators at the gate that he could not well see the proceedings. He stood at the edge of the crowd while day broke and speeches were said. Then abruptly two bound figures rose vertically from among their fellows to the top of the gatehouse, and there they hung, and there they died. Bottles were handed about, and the witnesses who had stood in silence began to talk again. In the evening, when he returned to that place, there was no one there at all. A guard leaned in the gatehouse portal chewing tobacco, and the hanged men at their rope ends looked like effigies for to frighten birds. As he drew near, he saw that it was toadvine and brown. He'd little money, and then he'd none. But he was in every dram house and gaming room, every cockpit and doggery. A quiet youth in a suit too large, and the same broken boots he'd come off the desert in. Standing just within the door of a foul saloon, with his eyes shifting under the brim of the hat he wore, and the light from a wall sconce on the side of his face he was taken for a male whore, and set up to drink, and then shown to the rear of the premises. He left his patron senseless in a mudroom, where there was no light. Other men found him on their own sordid missions, and other men took his purse and watch. Later still, someone took his shoes. He heard no news of the priest, and he'd quit asking. Returning to his lodgings one morning at daybreak in a gray rain, he saw a face slobbering in an upper window, and he climbed the stairwell and rapped at the door. A woman in a silk kimono opened the door and looked out at him. Behind her, in the room, a candle burned at a table, and in the pale light at the window, a half-wit sat in a pen with a cat. It turned to look at him. Not the judge's fool, but just some other fool. When the woman asked him what he wanted, he turned without speaking and descended the stairwell into the rain and the mud in the street. With his last two dollars, he bought from a soldier the scapular of heathen ears that Brown had worn to the scaffold. He was wearing them the next morning, when he hired out to an independent conductor from the state of Missouri, and he was wearing them when they set out for Fremont on the Sacramento River with a train of wagons and pack animals. If the conductor had any curiosity about the necklace, he kept it to himself. He was at this employment for some months, and he left it without notice. He traveled about from place to place. He didn't avoid the company of other men. He was treated with a certain deference, as one who had got on to terms with life beyond what his years could account for. By now he'd come by a horse and a revolver, the rudiments of an outfit. He worked at different trades. He had a Bible that he'd found at the mining camps, and he carried this book with him, no word of which could he read. In his dark and frugal clothes, some took him for a sort of preacher, but he was no witness to them, neither of things at hand nor things to come, he least of any man. They were remote places for news that he traveled in, and in those uncertain times men toasted the ascension of rulers already deposed, and hailed the coronation of kings murdered and in their graves. Of such corporal histories, even as these, he bore no tidings. And although it was the custom in that wilderness to stop with any traveler and exchange the news, he seemed to travel with no news at all, as if the doings of the world were too slanderous for him to truck with, or perhaps too trivial. He saw men killed with guns and with knives and with ropes, and he saw women fought over to the death whose value they themselves set at two dollars. He saw ships from the land of China chained in the small harbors, and bales of tea and silks and spices broken open with swords by small yellow men with speech like cats. On that lonely coast where the steep rocks cradled a dark and muttersome sea, he saw vultures at their soaring whose wingspans so dwarfed all lesser birds that the eagles shrieking underneath were more like terns or plovers.' 
He saw piles of gold a hat would scarcely have covered, wagered on the turn of a card and lost. And he saw bears and lions turned loose in pits to fight wild bulls to the death. And he was twice in the city of San Francisco and twice saw it burn and never went back, riding out on horseback along the road to the south where all night the shape of the city burned against the sky and burned again in the black waters of the sea where dolphins rolled through the flames, fire in the lake, through the fall of burning timbers and the cries of the lost. He never saw the ex-priest again. Of the judge, he heard rumor everywhere. In the spring of his twenty-eighth year, he set out with others upon the desert to the east, he one of five at hire to see a party through the wilderness to their homes halfway across the continent. Seven days from the coast at a desert well, he left them. They were just a band of pilgrims returning to their homes, men and women already dusty and travel-worn. He set the horse's face north toward the stone mountains, running thinly under the edge of the sky, and he rode the stars down and the sun up. It was no country he had ever seen, and there was no track to follow into those mountains, and there was no track out. Yet in the deepest fastness of those rocks he met with men who seemed unable to abide the silence of the world. He first saw them laboring over the plain in the dusk, among flowering ocotillo that burned in the final light like horned candelabra. They were led by a pitero, piping a reed, and then in procession a clanging of tambourines and matracas, and men naked to the waist in black capes and hoods, who flailed themselves with whips of braided yucca, and men who bore on their naked backs great loads of chola, and a man tied to a rope who was pulled this way and that by his companions, and a hooded man in a white robe who bore a heavy wooden cross on his shoulders. They were, all of them, barefoot, and they left a trail of blood across the rocks, and they were followed by a rude careta, in which sat a carved wooden skeleton who rattled along stiffly, holding before him a bow and arrow. He shared his cart with a load of stones, and they went trundling over the rocks, drawn by ropes tied to the heads and ankles of the bearers, and accompanied by a deputation of women who carried small desert flowers in their folded hands, or torches of sotal, or primitive lanterns of pierced tin. This troubled sect traversed slowly the ground under the bluff where the watchers stood, and made their way over the broken scree of a fan washed out of the draw above them, and wailing and piping and clanging they passed between the granite walls into the upper valley and disappeared in the coming darkness like heralds of some unspeakable calamity, leaving only bloody footprints on the stone. He bivouacked in a barren swale, and he and the horse lay down together, and all night the dry wind blew down the desert, and the wind was all but silent, for there was nothing of resonance among those rocks. In the dawn he and the horse stood watching the east where the light commenced, and then he saddled the horse and led it down a scrabbled trail through a canyon where he found a tank deep under a pitch of boulders. The water lay in darkness, and the stones were cool, and he drank and fetched water for the horse in his hat. Then he led the animal up onto the ridge, and they went on, the man watching the tableland to the south and the mountains to the north, and the horse clattering along behind by and by the horse began to toss its head, and soon it would not go. He stood holding the hackamore and studying the country. Then he saw the pilgrims. They were scattered about below him in a stone coulee, dead in their blood. He took down his rifle and squatted and listened. He led the horse under the shade of the rock wall and hobbled it and moved along the rock and down the slope. The company of penitents lay hacked and butchered among the stones in every attitude. Many lay about the fallen cross, and some were mutilated, and some were without heads. Perhaps they'd gathered under the cross for shelter, but the hole into which it had been set, and the cairn of rocks about its base, 
showed how it had been pushed over, and how the hooded altar Christ had been cut down and disemboweled, who now lay with the scraps of rope by which he had been bound still tied about his wrists and ankles. The kid rose and looked about at this desolate scene. And then he saw, alone and upright in a small niche in the rocks, an old woman kneeling in a faded reboso, with her eyes cast down. He made his way among the corpses and stood before her. She was very old, and her face was gray and leathery, and sand had collected in the folds of her clothing. She did not look up. The shawl that covered her head was much faded of its color, yet it bore, like a patent woven into the fabric, the figures of stars and quarter-moons and other insignia of a providence unknown to him. He spoke to her in a low voice. He told her that he was an American, and that he was a long way from the country of his birth, and that he had no family, and that he had traveled much and seen many things, and had been at war and endured hardships. He told her that he would convey her to a safe place, some party of her country people, who would welcome her, and that she should join them, for he could not leave her in this place, or she would surely die. He knelt on one knee, resting the rifle before him like a staff. Abuelita, he said, no puedes escucharme. He reached into the little cove and touched her arm. She moved slightly, her whole body, light and rigid. She weighed nothing. She was just a dried shell, and she had been dead in that place for years. Chapter 23 On the North Texas Plains An Old Buffalo Hunter The Millennial Herds The Bone Pickers Night on the Prairie The Callers Apache Ears Elrod Takes a Stand A Killing Bearing Off the Dead Fort Griffin The Beehive a stage show. The judge. Killing a bear. The judge speaks of old times. In preparation for the dance. The judge on war, destiny, the supremacy of man. The dance hall. The whore. The jakes and what was encountered there. Sie müssen schlafen, aber ich muss tanzen. In the late winter of 1878, he was on the plains of North Texas. He crossed the double mountain fork of the Brazos River on a morning when skim ice lay along the sandy shore, and he rode through a dark dwarf forest of black and twisted mesquite trees. He made his camp that night on a piece of high ground where there was a windbreak formed of a tree felled by lightning. He'd no sooner got his fire to burn than he saw across the prairie in the darkness another fire. Like his, it twisted in the wind. Like his, it warmed one man alone. It was an old hunter in camp, and the hunter shared tobacco with him and told him of the buffalo and the stands he'd made against them, laid up in a sag on some rise with the dead animals scattered over the grounds and the herd beginning to mill and the rifle barrel so hot the wiping patches sizzled in the bore and the animals by the thousands and tens of thousands and the hides pegged out over actual square miles of ground and the teams of skinners spelling one another around the clock and the shooting and shooting weeks and months till the bore shot slick and the stock shot loose at the tang, and their shoulders were yellow and blue to the elbow, and the tandem wagons groaned away over the prairie twenty and twenty-two ox teams, and the flint hides by the ton and hundred ton, and the meat rotting on the ground, and the air whining with flies, and the buzzards and ravens, and the night a horror of snarling and feeding, with the wolves half-crazed and wallowing in the carrion." I seen Studebaker wagons with six and eight ox teams headed out for the grounds, not hauling a thing but lead. Just pure galena. Tons of it. 
On this ground alone, between the Arkansas River and the Concho there, was eight million carcasses. For that's how many hides reached the railhead. Two year ago, we pulled out from Griffin for a last hunt. We ransacked the country. Six weeks. Finally found a herd of eight animals, and we killed them and come in. They're gone. Every one of them that God ever made is gone as if they'd never been at all. The ragged sparks blew down the wind. The prairie about them lay silent. Beyond the fire it was cold, and the night was clear, and the stars were falling. The old hunter pulled his blanket about him. I wonder if there's other worlds like this, he said, or if this is the only one. When he came upon the bone pickers, he'd been riding three days in a country he'd never seen. The plains were sear and burnt-looking, and the small trees black and misshapen, and haunted by ravens, and everywhere the ragged packs of jackal wolves, and the crazed and sun-chalked bones of the vanished herds. He dismounted and led the horse. Here and there, within the arc of ribs, a few flat discs of darkened lead, like old medallions of some order of the hunt. In the distance, teams of oxen bore along slowly, and the heavy wagons creaked dryly. Into these barrows the pickers tossed the bones, kicking down the calcined architecture, breaking apart the great frames with axes. The bones clattered in the wagons. They plowed on in the pale dust. He watched them pass, ragged, filthy, the oxen galled and mad-looking. None spoke to him. In the distance he could see a train of wagons moving off to the northeast with great tottering loads of bones, and further to the north other teams of pickers at their work. He mounted and rode on. The bones had been gathered into windrows ten feet high and hundreds long, or into great conical hills topped with the signs or brands of their owners. He overtook one of the lumbering carts, a boy riding the near-wheel ox and driving with a jerk-line and a jockey-stick. Two youths squatting atop a mound of skulls and pelvic bones leered down at him. Their fires dotted the plain that night, and he sat with his back to the wind and drank from an army canteen and ate a handful of parched corn for his supper. All across those reaches the yammer and yap of the starving wolves relayed, and to the north the silent lightning rigged a broken lyre upon the world's dark rim. The air smelled of rain, but no rain fell, and the creaking bone carts passed in the night like darkened ships, and he could smell the oxen and hear their breath. The sour smell of the bones was everywhere. Toward midnight a party hailed him as he squatted at his coals. "'Come up,' he said. They came up out of the dark, sullen wretches dressed in skins. They carried old military guns, save for one who had a buffalo rifle, and they had no coats, and one of them wore green hide boots peeled whole from the hocks of some animal, and the toes gathered shut with leader. "'Evening, stranger,' called out the eldest child among them. He looked at them. They were four and a half-grown boy, and they halted at the edge of the light and arranged themselves there. "'Come up,' he said. They shuffled forward. Three of them squatted and two stood. "'Where's the outfit?' said one. "'He ain't out for bones.' You ain't got nary chew of tobacco about your clothes, have you? He shook his head. Nary drink of whiskey, neither, I don't reckon. He ain't got no whiskey. Where you headed, mister? Are you headed towards Griffin? He looked them over. I am, he said. Going for the whores, I bet you. He ain't going for the whores. It's full of whores, Griffin is. Hell, he's probably been there more than you. You been to Griffin, mister? Not yet. Full of horse. Full plumb up. They say you can get clapped a day's ride out when the wind is right. 
They set in a tree in front of this here place, and you can look up and see their bloomers. I counted high as eight in that tree early of an evening. Set up there like coons and smoke cigarettes and holler down at you. It's set up to be the biggest town for sin in all Texas. It's as lively a place for murderers as you'd care to visit. Scrapes with knives, about any kind of meanness you can name. He looked at them from one to the other. He reached and took up a stick and roused the fire with it and put the stick in the flames. You all like meanness, he said. We don't hold with it. Like to drink whiskey? He's just talking. He ain't no whiskey drinker. You just not seen him drink it not an hour ago. I seen him puke it back up, too. What's them things around your neck there, mister? He pulled the aged scapular from his shirt front and looked at it. It's ears, he said. It's what? Ears. What kind of ears? He tugged at the thong and looked down at them. They were perfectly black and hard and dry and of no shape at all. Humans, he said. Human ears. Ain't done it, said the one with the rifle. Don't you call him a liar, Elrod. He's liable to shoot you. Let's see them things, mister, if you don't care. He slipped the scapular over his head and handed it across to the boy who'd spoken. They pressed about and felt the strange, dried pendants. Niggers, ain't it? they said. Dock them niggers here so they know them when they run off. How many is there, mister? I don't know. Used to be near a hundred. They held the thing up and turned it in the firelight. Nigger ears, by God. They ain't niggers. They ain't? No. What are they? Injuns. The hell they are. Hellride, you done been told. How come them to be so black as that if they ain't niggers? They turned that way. They got blacker till they couldn't black no more. Where'd you get them at? Killed them sums of bitches, didn't you, mister? You've been a scout on the prairies, ain't you? I bought them ears in California off a soldier in a saloon, didn't have no money to drink on. He reached and took the scapular from them. Shoot, I bet he's been a scout on the prairie, killed every one of them sons of bitches. The one called Elrod followed the trophies with his chin and sniffed the air. I don't see what you want with them things, he said. I wouldn't have them. The others looked at him uneasily. You don't know where them ears come from. That old boy you bought them off might have said they was engines, but that don't make it so. The man didn't answer. Them ears could have come off of cannibals or any other kind of foreign nigger. They tell me you can buy the whole heads in New Orleans. Sailors brings him in, and you can buy them for five dollars all day long, them heads. Hush, Elrod. The man sat holding the necklace in his hands. They wasn't cannibals, he said. They was Apaches. I knowed the man that docked him. Knowed him and rode with him and seen him hung. Elrod looked at the others and grinned. Apaches, he said. I bet them old Apaches would give a watermelon a pure fit. What about you all? The man looked up wearily. You ain't calling me a liar, are you, son? I ain't you, son. How old are you? That's some more of your business. How old are you? He's fifteen. You hush your damn mouth. He turned to the man. He don't speak for me, he said. He's done spoke. I was fifteen year old when I was first shot. I ain't never been shot. You ain't sixteen yet, neither. You aim to shoot me? I aim to try to keep from it. Come on, Elrod. You ain't gonna shoot nobody. Maybe in the back or them asleep. Elrod, we're gone. I knowed you for what you was when I seen you. You better go on. Sit there and talk about shooting somebody. They ain't nobody done it yet. 
The other four stood at the limits of the firelight. The youngest of them was casting glances out at the dark sanctuary of the prairie night. Go on, the man said. They're waiting on you. He spat into the man's fire and wiped his mouth. Out on the prairie to the north, a train of yoked wagons was passing, and the oxen were pale and silent in the starlight, and the wagons creaked faintly in the distance, and a lantern with a red glass followed them out like an alien eye. This country was filled with violent children, orphaned by war. His companions had started back to fetch him, and perhaps this emboldened him the more, and perhaps he said other things to the man, for when they got to the fire the man had risen to his feet. "'You keep him away from me,' he said. "'I see him back here. I'll kill him.' When they had gone, he built up the fire, and caught the horse, and took the hobbles off, and tied it, and saddled it, and then he moved off apart, and spread his blanket, and lay down in the dark." When he woke, there was still no light in the east. The boy was standing by the ashes of the fire with the rifle in his hand. The horse had snuffed, and now it snuffed again. I knowed you'd be hid out, the boy called. He pushed back the blanket and rolled onto his stomach and cocked the pistol and leveled it at the sky where the clustered stars were burning for eternity. He centered the foresight in the milled groove of the frame strap, and, holding the piece so, he swung it through the dark of the trees with both hands to the darker shape of the visitor. "'I'm right here,' he said. The boy swung with a rifle and fired. "'You wouldn't have lived anyway,' the man said. It was gray dawn when the others came up. They had no horses. They led the half-grown boy to where the dead youth was lying on his back with his hands composed upon his chest. "'We don't want no trouble, mister. We just want to take him with us.' "'Take him.' "'I knowed we'd bury him on this prairie.' "'They come out here from Kentucky, mister. This tyke and his brother. His mama and daddy both dead. His granddaddy was killed by a lunatic and buried in the woods like a dog.' He's never known good fortune in his life, and now he ain't got a soul in this world. Randall, you take a good look at the man that has made you an orphan. The orphan in his large clothes, holding the old musket with the mended stock, stared at him woodenly. He was maybe twelve years old, and he looked not so much dull-witted as insane. Two of the others were going through the dead boy's pockets. Where's his rifle at, mister? The man stood with his hand on his belt. He nodded to where the rifle stood against a tree. They brought it over and presented it to the brother. It was a Sharps fifty caliber, and holding it and the musket, he stood inanely armed, his eyes skittering. One of the older boys handed him the dead boy's hat, and then he turned to the man. He gave forty dollars for that rifle in Little Rock. You can buy them in Griffin for ten. They ain't worth nothing. Randall, you ready to go? He did not assist as a bearer, for he was too small. When they set out across the prairie with his brother's body carried up on their shoulders, he followed behind carrying the musket and the dead boy's rifle and the dead boy's hat. The man watched them go. Out there was nothing. They were simply bearing the body off over the bone-strewn waste toward a naked horizon. The orphan turned once to look back at him, and then he hurried to catch up. In the afternoon he rode through the Mackenzie crossing of the clear fork of the Brazos River, and he and the horse walked side by side down the twilight toward the town where in the long red dusk and in the darkness the random aggregate of the lamps formed slowly a false shore of hospice, cradled on the low plain before them. They passed enormous ricks of bones, colossal dikes composed of horned skulls and the crescent ribs, like old ivory bows heaped in the aftermath of some legendary battle. 
great levees of them curving away over the plain into the night. They entered the town in a light rain falling. The horse nickered and snuffed shyly at the hocks of the other animals standing at stall before the lamp-lit banyos they passed. Fiddle music issued into the solitary mud street, and lean dogs crossed before them from shadow to shadow. At the end of the town he led the horse to a rail, and tied it among the others, and stepped up the low wooden stairs into the dim light that fell from the doorway there. He looked back a last time at the street, and at the random window lights let into the darkness, and at the last pale light in the west and the low dark hills around. Then he pushed open the door and entered. A dimly seething rabble had coagulated within. As if the raw board structure erected for their containment occupied some ultimate sink into which they had gravitated from off the surrounding flatlands. An old man in a Tyrolean costume was shuffling among the rough tables with his hat out held, while a little girl in a smock cranked a barrel organ, and a bear in a crinoline twirled strangely upon a board stage defined by a row of tallow candles that dripped and sputtered in their pools of grease. He made his way through the crowd to the bar where several men in gaitered shirts were drawing beer or pouring whiskey. Young boys worked behind them fetching crates of bottles and racks of glasses steaming from the scullery to the rear. The bar was covered with zinc, and he placed his elbows upon it and spun a silver coin before him and slapped it flat. "'Speak or forever,' said the barman. "'A whiskey. Whiskey it is.' He set up a glass and uncorked a bottle and poured perhaps half a gill and took the coin. He stood looking at the whiskey. Then he took his hat off and placed it on the bar and took up the glass and drank it very deliberately and set the empty glass down again. He wiped his mouth and turned around and placed his elbows on the bar behind him. Watching him across the layered smoke in the yellow light was the judge. He was sitting at one of the tables. He wore a round hat with a narrow brim, and he was among every kind of man, herder and bullwhacker and drover and freighter and miner and hunter and soldier and peddler and gambler and drifter and drunkard and thief. And he was among the dregs of the earth in beggary a thousand years, and he was among the scapegrace scions of eastern dynasties. And in all that motley assemblage he sat by them, and yet alone, as if he were some other sort of man entire, and he seemed little changed or none in all these years. He turned away from those eyes, and stood looking down at the empty tumbler between his fists. When he looked up, the barman was watching him. He raised his forefinger, and the barman brought the whiskey. He paid, he lifted the glass, and drank. There was a mirror along the back bar, but it held only smoke and phantoms. The barrel organ was groaning and creaking, and the bear, with tongue alaw, was revolving heavily on the boards. When he turned, the judge had risen, and was speaking with other men. The showman made his way through the throng, shaking the coins in his hat. Garishly clad whores were going out through a door at the rear of the premises, and he watched them, and he watched the bear, and when he looked back across the room, the judge wasn't there. The showman seemed to be in altercation with the man standing at the table. Another man rose. The showman gestured with his hat. One of them pointed toward the bar. He shook his head. Their voices were incoherent in the din. On the boards, the bear was dancing for all that his heart was worth, and the girl cranked the organ handle, and the shadow of the act which the candlelight constructed upon the wall might have gone begging for reference in any daylight world. When he looked back, the showman had donned the hat, and he stood with his hands on his hips. One of the men had drawn a long-barreled cavalry pistol from his belt. He turned and leveled the pistol toward the stage. Some dove for the floor. 
Some reached for their own arms. The owner of the bear stood like a pitchman at a shooting gallery. The shot was thunderous, and in the afterclap all sound in that room ceased. The bear had been shot through the midsection. He let out a low moan, and he began to dance faster, dancing in silence save for the slap of his great footpads on the planks. Blood was running down his groin. The little girl strapped into the barrel organ stood frozen, the crank at rest on the upswing. The man with the pistol fired again, and the pistol bucked and roared, and the black smoke rolled, and the bear groaned and began to reel drunkenly. He was holding his chest, and a thin foam of blood swung from his jaw, and he began to totter and to cry like a child. And he took a few last steps, dancing, and crashed to the boards. Someone had seized the pistol arm of the man who'd done the shooting, and the gun was waving aloft. The owner of the bear stood stunned, clutching the brim of his old-world hat. "'Shot the goddamn bear!' said the barman. The little girl had unbuckled herself out of the barrel organ, and it clattered wheezing to the floor. She ran forward and knelt and gathered the great shaggy head up in her arms and began to rock back and forth, sobbing. Most of the men in the room had risen, and they stood in the smoky yellow space with their hands on their sidearms. Whole flocks of whores were scuttling toward the rear, and a woman mounted to the boards and stepped past the bear and held out her hands. "'It's all over,' she said. "'It's all over.' "'Do you believe it's all over, son?' He turned. The judge was standing at the bar looking down at him. He smiled. He removed his hat. The great pale dome of his skull shone like an enormous phosphorescent egg in the lamplight. "'The last of the true. The last of the true. I'd say they're all gone under now, saving me and thee.' Would you not? He tried to see past him. That great corpus enshadowed him from all beyond. He could hear the woman announcing the commencement of dancing in the hall to the rear. And some are not yet born who shall have cause to curse the Dauphin's soul, said the judge. He turned slightly. Plenty of time for the dance. I ain't studying no dance. The judge smiled. The Tyrolean and another man were bent over the bear. The girl was sobbing, the front of her dress dark with blood. The judge leaned across the bar and seized a bottle and snapped the cork out of it with his thumb. The cork whined off into the blackness above the lamps like a bullet. He rifled a great drink down his throat and leaned back against the bar. "'You're here for the dance,' he said. I got to go. The judge looked aggrieved. Go, he said. He nodded. He reached and took hold of his hat where it lay on the bar, but he didn't take it up, and he didn't move. What man would not be a dancer if he could, said the judge. It's a great thing, the dance. The woman was kneeling and had her arm around the little girl. The candles sputtered, and the great hairy mound of the bear, dead in its crinoline, lay like some monster slain in the commission of unnatural acts. The judge poured the tumbler full where it stood empty alongside the hat and nudged it forward. "'Drink up,' he said. "'Drink up. This night thy soul may be required of thee.' He looked at the glass. The judge smiled and gestured with the bottle. He took up the glass and drank. The judge watched him. "'Was it always your idea,' he said, "'that if you did not speak you would not be recognized?' "'You see me.' The judge ignored this. "'I recognized you when I first saw you, "'and yet you were a disappointment to me. "'Then?' And now. Even so, at the last, I find you here with me. I ain't with you, 
The judge raised his bald brow. Not, he said. He looked about him in a puzzled and artful way, and he was a passable thespian. I never come here hunting you. What then, said the judge? What would I want with you? I come here same reason as any man. And what reason is that? What reason is what? That these men are here. They come here to have a good time. The judge watched him. He began to point out various men in the room, and to ask if these men were here for a good time, or if indeed they knew why they were here at all. Everybody don't have to have a reason to be someplace. That's so, said the judge. They do not have to have a reason. But order is not set aside because of their indifference. He regarded the judge warily. Let me put it this way, said the judge. If it is so that they themselves have no reason, and yet are indeed here, must they not be here by reason of some other? And if this is so, can you guess who that other might be? No. Can you? I know him well. He poured the tumbler full once more, and he took a drink himself from the bottle, and he wiped his mouth and turned to regard the room. This is an orchestration for an event. For a dance, in fact. The participants will be apprised of their roles at the proper time. For now it is enough that they have arrived. As the dance is the thing with which we are concerned and contains complete within itself its own arrangement and history and finale, there is no necessity that the dancers contain these things within themselves as well. In any event, the history of all is not the history of each, nor indeed the sum of those histories. And none here can finally comprehend the reason for his presence, for he has no way of knowing even in what the event consists. In fact, were he to know, he might well absent himself. And you can see that that cannot be any part of the plan, if plan there be. He smiled. His great teeth shone. He drank. An event, a ceremony, the orchestration thereof. The overture carries certain marks of decisiveness. It includes the slaying of a large bear. The evening's progress will not appear strange or unusual, even to those who question the rightness of the events so ordered. A ceremony, then. One could well argue that there are not categories of no ceremony, but only ceremonies of greater or lesser degree. And deferring to this argument, we will say that this is a ceremony of a certain magnitude, perhaps more commonly called a ritual. A ritual includes the letting of blood. Rituals which fail in this requirement are but mock rituals. Here every man knows the false at once, never doubt it. That feeling in the breast that evokes a child's memory of loneliness, such as when the others have gone and only the game is left with its solitary participant. A solitary game without opponent, where only the rules are at hazard. Don't look away. We're not speaking in mysteries. You of all men are no stranger to that feeling, the emptiness and the despair. It is that which we take arms against, is it not? Is not blood the tempering agent in the mortar which bonds? The judge leaned closer. What do you think death is, man? Of whom do we speak? when we speak of a man who was and is not. Are these blind riddles, or are they not some part of every man's jurisdiction? What is death if not an agency? And whom does he intend toward? Look at me. I don't like craziness. Nor I, nor I, bear with me. Look at them now. Pick a man, any man. 
That man there, see him? That man, hatless. You know his opinion of the world. You can read it in his face, in his stance. Yet his complaint that a man's life is no bargain masks the actual case with him, which is that men will not do as he wishes them to, have never done, never will do. That's the way of things with him, and his life is so balked about by difficulty and becomes so altered of its intended architecture that he is little more than a walking hovel, hardly fit to house the human spirit at all. Can he say, such a man, that there is no malign thing set against him? That there is no power and no force and no cause? What manner of heretic could doubt agency and claimant alike? Can he believe that the wreckage of his existence is unentailed? No liens, no creditors? That gods of vengeance and of compassion alike lie sleeping in their crypt, and whether our cries are for an accounting or for the destruction of the ledgers altogether, they must evoke only the same silence, and that it is this silence which will prevail. To whom is he talking, man? Can't you see him? The man was indeed muttering to himself and peering balefully about the room, wherein it seemed there was no friend to him. A man seeks his own destiny and no other, said the judge, will or nil. Any man who could discover his own fate and elect, therefore, some opposite course could only come at last to that selfsame reckoning at the same appointed time. For each man's destiny is as large as the world he inhabits and contains within it all opposites as well. This desert upon which so many have been broken is vast and calls for largeness of heart. But it is also ultimately empty. It is hard. It is barren. Its very nature is stone. He poured the tumbler full. Drink up, he said. The world goes on. We have dancing nightly, and this night is no exception. The straight and the winding way are one, and now that you are here, what do the years count since last we two met together? Men's memories are uncertain, and the past that was differs little from the past that was not. He took up the tumbler the judge had poured, and he drank, and set it down again. He looked at the judge. I've been everywhere, he said. This is just one more place. The judge arched his brow. Did you post witnesses? He said. To report to you on the continuing existence of those places once you'd quit them? That's crazy. Is it? Where is yesterday? Where is Glanton and Brown? And where is the priest? He leaned closer. Where is Shelby? whom you left to the mercies of Elias in the desert? And where is Tate, whom you abandoned in the mountains? Where are the ladies, ah, the fair and tender ladies, with whom you danced at the governor's ball when you were a hero, anointed with the blood of the enemies of the Republic you'd elected to defend? And where is the fiddler, and where the dance? I guess you can tell me. I tell you this. As war becomes dishonored and its nobility called into question, those honorable men who recognize the sanctity of blood will become excluded from the dance, which is the warrior's right, and thereby will the dance become a false dance, and the dancers false dancers. And yet there will be one there always who is a true dancer, and can you guess who that might be? You ain't nothing. You speak truer than you know. But I will tell you. Only that man who has offered himself entire to the blood of war, who has been to the floor of the pit and seen horror in the round, and learned at last that it speaks to his inmost heart, only that man can dance. Even a dumb animal can dance.
The judge set the bottle on the bar. Hear me, man, he said. There is room on the stage for one beast and one alone. All others are destined for a night that is eternal and without name. One by one they will step down into the darkness before the footlamps. Bears that dance, bears that don't. He drifted with the crowd toward the door at the rear. In the anteroom sat men at cards, dim in the smoke. He moved on. A woman was taking chits from the men as they passed through to the shed at the rear of the building. She looked up at him. He had no chit. She directed him to a table where a woman was selling the chits and stuffing the money with a piece of shingle through a narrow slit into an iron strongbox. He paid his dollar and took the stamped brass token and rendered it up at the door and passed through. He found himself in a large hall, with a platform for the musicians at one end and a large homemade sheet-iron stove at the other. Whole squadrons of horrors were working the floor. In their stained peignoirs, in their green stockings and melon-colored drawers, they drifted through the smoky oil light like make-believe wantons at once childlike and lewd. A dark little dwarf of a whore took his arm and smiled up at him. I seen you right away, she said. I always pick the one I want. She led him through a door where an old Mexican woman was handing out towels and candles, and they ascended like refugees of some sordid disaster the darkened, plank-board stairwell to the upper rooms. Lying in the little cubicle with his trousers about his knees, he watched her. He watched her take up her clothes and don them, and he watched her hold the candle to the mirror and study her face there. She turned and looked at him. Let's go, she said. I got to go. Go on. You can't lay there. Come on, I got to go. He sat up and swung his legs over the edge of the little iron cot and stood and pulled his trousers up and buttoned them and buckled his belt. His hat was on the floor and he picked it up and slapped it against the side of his leg and put it on. You need to get down there and get you a drink, she said. You'll be all right. I'm all right now. He went out. He turned at the end of the hallway and looked back. Then he went down the stairs. She had come to the door. She stood in the hallway holding the candle and brushing her hair back with one hand. And she watched him descend into the dark of the stairwell, and then she pulled the door shut behind her. He stood at the edge of the dance floor. A ring of people had taken the floor and were holding hands and grinning and calling out to one another. A fiddler sat on a stool on the stage, and a man walked up and down calling out the order of the dance and gesturing and stepping in the way he wished them to go. Outside in the darkened lot, groups of wretched Tonkawas stood in the mud, with their faces composed in strange lost portraits within the sashwork of the window lights. The fiddler rose and set the fiddle to his jaw. There was a shout and the music began and the ring of dancers began to rotate ponderously with a great shuffling. He went out the back. The rain had stopped and the air was cold. He stood in the yard. Stars were falling across the sky, myriad and random, speeding along brief vectors from their origins in night to their destinies in dust and nothingness. Within the hall the fiddle squealed and the dancers shuffled and stopped. In the street, men were calling for the little girl whose bear was dead, for she was lost. They went among the darkened lots with lanterns and torches calling out to her. He went down the walkboard toward the Jakes. He stood outside listening to the voices fading away, and he looked again at the silent tracks of the stars where they died over the darkened hills. Then he opened the rough board door of the Jakes and stepped in. The judge was seated upon the closet. He was naked, and he rose up smiling, and gathered him in his arms against his immense and terrible flesh, and shot the wooden bar latch home behind him.
In the saloon, two men who wanted to buy the hide were looking for the owner of the bear. The bear lay on the stage in an immense pool of blood. All the candles had gone out save one, and it guttered uneasily in its grease like a votive lamp. In the dance hall, a young man had joined the fiddler, and he kept the measure of the music with a pair of spoons, which he clapped between his knees. The whores sashayed half-naked, some with their breasts exposed. In the mudded dogyard behind the premises, two men went down the boards toward the jakes. A third man was standing there, urinating into the mud. "'Is someone in there?' the first man said. The man who was relieving himself didn't look up. "'I wouldn't go in there if I was you,' he said. "'Is there somebody in there?' "'I wouldn't go in.' He hitched himself up and buttoned his trousers and stepped past them and went up the walk toward the lights. The first man watched him go and then opened the door of the jakes. "'Good God Almighty!' he said. "'What is it?' He didn't answer. He stepped past the other and went back up the walk. The other man stood looking after him. Then he opened the door and looked in. In the saloon they had rolled the dead bear onto a wagon sheet, and there was a general call for hands. In the anteroom the tobacco smoke circled the lamps like an evil fog, and the men bid and dealt in a low mutter. There was a lull in the dancing, and a second fiddler took the stage, and the two plucked their strings and turned the little hardwood pegs until they were satisfied. Many among the dancers were staggering drunk through the room, and some had rid themselves of shirts and jackets and stood bare-chested and sweating, even though the room was cold enough to cloud their breath. An enormous whore stood clapping her hands at the bandstand and calling drunkenly for the music. She wore nothing but a pair of men's drawers, and some of her sisters were likewise clad in what appeared to be trophies, hats or pantaloons, or blue twill cavalry jackets. As the music sawed up, there was a lively cry from all, and a caller stood at the front and called out the dance, and the dancers stomped and hooted and lurched against one another. And they are dancing the board floor slamming under the jackboots, and the fiddlers grinning hideously over their canted pieces. Towering over them all is the judge, and he is naked dancing, his small feet lively and quick, and now in double time, and bowing to the ladies, huge and pale and hairless, like an enormous infant. He never sleeps, he says. He says he'll never die. He bows to the fiddlers and sashays backwards and throws back his head and laughs deep in his throat. And he is a great favorite, the judge. He wafts his hat, and the lunar dome of his skull passes palely under the lamps, and he swings about and takes possession of one of the fiddles, and he pirouettes and makes a pass, two passes, dancing and fiddling at once. His feet are light and nimble. He never sleeps. He says that he will never die. He dances in light and in shadow, and he is a great favorite. He never sleeps, the judge. He is dancing, dancing. He says that he will never die. The end. The end. The end. The end. Epilogue. In the dawn there is a man progressing over the plain by means of holes which he is making in the ground. He uses an implement with two handles, and he chucks it into the hole, and he enkindles the stone in the hole with his steel, hole by hole, striking the fire out of the rock which God has put there. On the plain behind him are the wanderers in search of bones, and those who do not search and they move haltingly in the light, like mechanisms whose movements are monitored with escapement and palate, so that they appear restrained by a prudence or reflectiveness which has no inner reality, 
and they cross in their progress one by one that track of holes that runs to the rim of the visible ground, and which seems less the pursuit of some continuance than the verification of a principle, a validation of sequence and causality, as if each round and perfect hole owed its existence to the one before it there on that prairie, upon which are the bones and the gatherers of bones and those who do not gather. He strikes fire in the hole and draws out his steel. Then they all move on again. The End You've been listening to Blood Meridian, or The Evening Redness in the West, by Cormac McCarthy, narrated by Richard Poe and directed by Greta Byram.